probably still debating uh-huh. that, should I take it out or not sir ajay we are live now in this room b delhi jaipur my batchmate is there thank you priya professor ravi ravi badal sir hmm ha ಪ್ರೆಸೆಂಟೇಷನ್ just a couple of minutes more dr rajesh it's 7 years 58 Sir. rajesh is the first year yeah, dr kalpesh has joined in also okay then i'll we'll start here yeah, there is connected good evening dr kalpesh welcome i think he is muted sorry yes hello yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, doctor kalpesh welcome good evening good evening everyone good evening good evening dr kalpesh i am seeing you after 6 years after 6 years 6 years yes 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 i know i know nice to meet you sir yeah 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 please to me I see you uh, ananya yeah you have the last time i saw, saw you you yeah. had a lot of hair you had hair that's what foot and ankle has done <laughs> you, see, you see rajesh as well is going that way so okay yeah it's going to happen to all of us <laughs> so has the um, so uh, is it has the meeting started is it uh, yeah we are yeah. starting yeah. now we are just live now we yeah, will start yeah. we just waiting for you good evening everybody on behalf of us i would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you we have a very interesting session planned today a newer perspective and put an angle we have young and dynamic lineup of faculty who have extensive work and will share their knowledge and experience with us I thank the faculty and the panelists for taking out time from the busy schedule to be a part of this webinar and to share their experience with us for sure will help us in our day to day practice. Today we have an international faculty Dr. Alpesh Shah from Golden Jubilee Hospital Glasgow. Then we have experienced Dr. Sundarajan from Ganga Hospital Coimbatore. He was president of Foot and Ankle Society. Dr. Rajesh Simon, consultant Lakeside hospital kochi who is a former secretary foot and ankle society then we have dr ajay from ramaya medical college bangalore who has been doing a lot of work in this area dr ananya puttaraju from swash hospital bangalore who is going to give us an insight on arthroscopic ankle fusion and we have our own dr shekhar from S- sanjay gandhi institute of trauma and orthopedic who is doing an ifas ifas fellowship in glasgow thank you once again to make the webinar more interactive we have a highly experienced trauma surgeon from bangalore who need no introduction that's dr vanmali professor from B- bangalore medical college and dr ravish professor from kims thank you sir now i hand over the session to dr ajay okay. ajay you can continue okay yes okay okay a very good evening and uh... welcome to one and all and uh, for that uh, thanks dr madhav for this brief introduction i'd like to thank the bangalore orthopedic society for uh, having uh, conceptualized this uh, particular webinar on foot and ankle surgery and uh, dr uday kumar who so the scientific uh, committee chairperson who has generally been instrumental in uh, putting through all the uh, uh, topics for the uh, for the webinar and uh, dr avinash the secretary dr madan the president and uh, all my dear friends here uh, so dr ravish dr vanmali from the bios and from the ifas we have uh, dr sundarajan dr uh, rajesh simon ananyam dr kalpesh and uh, 
Shekhar. So, uh, welcome one and all to this uh, session. So, all along, what has been thought is that foot and ankle is associated with generally trauma. And uh, if we are thinking of a foot and ankle in a general orthopedic meeting, so we are looking either at trauma, so wherein we are discussing the same talus, the same uh, calcaneus fractures or the distant fractures, or we are talking about diabetes or something of that sort, wherein we are de dis debating about the diabetic foot, the active manages, uh, management for all of that. So that's why I thought we will have a different perspective today. So let us look at the newer things which are coming up in the field of foot and ankle. They are new to us, but then they have been here for a very long time. Dr. Kalpesh, who has had extensive experience with the total ankle arthroplasty, is uh, going to enlighten us about that. And uh, Shekhar, who has uh, been there as a fellow from uh, the Indian Foot and Ankle Society. In fact, uh, he's the very first fellow who's been selected on a long-term fellowship. That's the one-year fellowship. And uh, so he would be speaking to us about daycare total ankle arthroplasty. So, so these are like new concepts I thought we should be including in uh, uh, the uh, discussions here in uh, Bangalore Orthopedic Society. Then uh, Dr. Sundarajan, of course, uh, doesn't need an introduction at all. So he's uh, been with the Ganga Orthopedic uh, Center for quite some time now. And he has been the president of the Indian Foot and Ankle Society in the past. And uh, he has extensive experience both with foot and ankle as well as arthroscopy. So, and uh, uh, he's reached the pinnacle in both the fields. I think uh, even as the Indian Arthroplasty Society, I think he's reaching up as a as a president, Dr. Sudarajan, or um, your secretary. elector, secretary. Yes. Going to be secretary. Okay. Secretary and uh, uh, yes. So, so in both the fields, so he, he that so he's combining both of them and he's presenting to us about arthroscopy of the foot and ankle and the lateral ligament reconstruction in that. Dr. Rajesh Simon uh, has been the past president, uh, past secretary of the Indian Foot and Ankle Society. He's been a past president of the Kochi, he's past or present of the Kochi Orthopedic Society. Dr. Rajesh? Past. <coughs> past. Past, yes. So, 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 so uh, of both. And uh, he also has got extensive experience with arthroscopy of the foot and ankle and newer procedures in foot and ankle. But today he will be discussing with us regarding the syndesmotic injuries. And uh, Dr. Ananya is uh, from uh, Bangalore itself. He is working at the hospital and uh, has extensive experience with uh, uh, foot and ankle scopy as well as a lot of other procedures. So he is uh, uh, into everything. I think he, he does the plasties the same that he does uh, foot and ankle scopies. So he is going to speak to us with the regarding uh, foot and ankle uh, uh, arthrodesis using the uh, arthroscopic techniques. So uh, as we are ready to go in now, I think uh, can I request to Dr. Rajesh Simon to start off with the topic on syndesmotic injuries. Thank you, Ajay, and thank you, Bangalore Orthopedic Society, Office Bearers, and the members of Bangalore Orthopedic Society for giving me the opportunity. Uh, we all know about syndesmosis, nothing uh, very new to any of the trauma surgeons. But then uh, what are we discussing of? So we'll have certain things uh, going. So am I, am, am my screen visible? Yes. Yeah. So uh, syndesmotic injury occurs at about 10 to 14% of all the ankles. And it can uh, be an occult injury also, which are many a times missed. So what is syndesmosis? We all know about that anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament, the intrauscious ligament, and the posterior inferior, so, uh, inferior uh, transverse ligament. All these three ligament forms the, the, the combination of the syndesmosis. And it is important to stabilize the talus under the tibia, and it should be perfectly matched. If it is not, we all know it is leads to arthritis. So you, it can have a deg very degree of instability depending upon the injury level which has happened. So investigation, x-ray, most important here is the mortise view, wherein you take uh, in the picture of the medial clear space and uh, you look at, at it, it should be normal in all the, four, all the three directions. The tibiofibular uh, clear space, that should be actually seen one centimeter above the joint and it should be less than five 
millimeters or the talocrotal angle. So all this uh, are the important uh, measurements or the things which you should see in an X-ray to understand whether the, there is a fracture with or a syndesmotic injury without fracture. Intraoperative assessment, you have fixed fibula, you can always do something of a cotton test where you put the, you push it laterally, but always, always look at the AP translation also, which is very important to see. And it is not just the lateral displacement, which is important. Now we all know the importance of posterior malleolus. So if you have a large posterior malleolus or even a small, the size doesn't matter. You have to have, if you think it is other than a flake fracture, you got to fix the posterior malleolus. And anatomic fixation of posterior malleolus itself is gives the stability to syndesmosis. So you're giving a bony stability to a syndesmotic ligament, syndesmosis. So Fixation of posterior malleolus is very important if you have a posterior malleolus fracture. Something which we all should know how to fix, it should be two to four centimeter above the joint line. The screw should be parallel to the joint line. Because the fibula is down, you need to have an anterior angulation of 30 degrees and at least three cortices. And it should be a lag screw. You don't want a compression screw, so it should be a positional screw and not a lag screw. So how have we been doing here in this? Um, are we good? So this, look at this particular, this is how we all have been doing, putting screw and then putting a clamp. Are we red, red, doing sharp? So the, the problem here is when you take a post-op CT, when the patient is having pain or there is some abnormality in the X-ray and when you take a post-op CT, you realize that the screw should be, the syntosmosis, uh, the fibula should have been in the incisora, but you have fixed it in a different place. And that is the problem. So post-op CT, when it started, people started reviewing, they found that more than 50% of the in malremus. So we are not good as we think that we are. So that is something important. It is not about a junior fixing. It is about all the people. It could be seniors, it could be juniors. It is because the X-ray, the CM picture, which we rely so much on, is not very, uh, very helpful intraoperative. So syndesmotic malreduction is one of the most important, important independent predictor of the clinical outcomes. So. The problem here is uh, where is the incisor and where do we fix because there is different size uh, shapes of the incisor. So uh, the, the, the classical, uh, the, 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 the teaching we should have the exact incisor, but the problem is definition of the inc fibula incisor is difficult because if you look at different cities, it is different in different people. So syndesmosis as such is a very controversial tune if you say, it in, in the ankle. So what are the controversies? A lot of things. What type of fixation? Is it screw? Now we have tight rope, which is better. Size of the screw, 3.5, 4.5. Number of cortices, position of the ankle, post-op weight bearing, implant removal or not, especially the syndesmotic screw. So there are a lot of things which are on the gray area. Let us discuss each one of them. Screw fixation, definitely a rigid fixation and a very good stabilizing agent. But again, you're rigidly malreducing, malreduction if you're not fixed properly. Loosening and breakage is always there. You might have a longer rehab if you don't do it. Tight rope, the advantage is they say that the moment you tight, uh, the tighten the tight rope, it finds its home. So, and there is no reduction, no removal uh, of hardware requires. But then there is a problem here also. We have found different studies have found that it is less effective at providing a sagittal plane stability. And you need to have a plate fixation along with, it's not a stand alone fixator. These are the various meta-analysis that came in a very recent literature, this is 2020 March, where they say that two year follow-up, there is a, a advantage over the as far as the syndesmotic screw is concerned, the tight rope, 
with titrope. So it reduces the number of complications of clinical outcomes. So there's another meta-analysis of the RCTs, the five RCTs. They saw, they've found that suture buttons definitely has got a better clinical outcome. I mean, clinical higher AOFAR score compared to syndesmotic screw, but the clinical outcome is almost similar, but no fewer complications again in the, uh, the suture buttons group. So a present day, these are the very latest um, kind of literature that both these are 2020 literatures showing a slight advantage of suture buttons. But if you look at little more previous ones, 46 patients here, they did uh, similar tight trope and 23 uh, screw fixation. They found either way, malreduction, if you do it in either way, it is the only independent variable uh, predictor of, so even if you're doing a syndesmotic tight trope, you cannot afford to have a, a, a malunion. So this is another study wherein again uh, found that there's no significant difference as far as an osteoarthritis or a functional outcome is concerned if you're doing it good, but if you're doing it bad, both are problematic. So the, the, the debate between screw fixation and tightrope, slight advantage with a recent literature over of a tightrope over the screw, but both will work if you do it right, both will not work, can fail if you do it wrong. So here you have perfectly fitted two screws, but the medial clear space is not reduced. So there is this, in, and the, the fibula overlap is more. So there is a problem here. Here you have a tight rope, same problem. So different implants, same problem. So the, 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 either the take home message is you got to reduce it properly, whichever implant it is. Now, how many screws? A lot of juniors do ask us. Three single screw or double screw? One cortices, I mean, three cortices, four cortices, six cortices, eight cortices, whatever. Does it matter? This was a uh, study done by Mulligan, and they said that three cortices, there is a the problem in loosening, while four cortices, there is a problem in breaking. But it doesn't matter. Hoynes in found, uh, found in 2004 that there is no significant group, uh, differences between the two groups as far as the functional score is concerned. So three cortices, three cortices or four cortices, two screws or four screws, doesn't matter as long as you're doing good. Which type of screw, 3.5 or 4.5? Review article again where I wang says that there's no biomechanical advantage by putting a bigger screw over a smaller screw. We all were taught that when you're fixing the tightrope, dorsiflex it maximally. That is because of this flustrum type of shape of the talus, which we thought that would be helpful if you dorsiflex it. But then a classical study by Tornado said that there was no difference in whichever position of the ankle is. So whichever way you just fix it properly, no malreduction, and it helps. Now, if you're putting a screw, when do we remove it? This was an initial uh, the landmark study by Shepherds who said that removal of screw is, should be reserved only if there is a hardware irritation and a decreased range of movement. Otherwise, don't uh, remove. If it breaks, pay, prime the patient before you put the screw or immediately after that this is going to break, don't worry about it. Another uh, recent in 2016, when Ramelt and team went and uh, did a systemic review and said that current literature does not provide evidence to support the removal of syndesmotic screw. So the evidence is forget removal, only remove if there is a problem and always prime the patient and the relatives about possible breakage of the implant. So the problem here is always about the malreduction and Patients with malreduction perform significantly worse as far as the functional outcomes are concerned. How do you reduce this malreduction? How can we go about it? So this was a paper by, from uh, Jan et al. in 2013, and he found this was one of the first papers that say that syndesmotic exploration, so you are now talking about an open reduction of syndesmosis. You make sure that the fibula is in the incisora, 
and then you fix the uh, whatever way, either screw or tight rope, and open reduction of internal fixation gives a better results in terms of movements and functional scores. So how do you do it? You make a, uh, after you're fixing it, make a small uh, window over the anterior aspect, then put the clamp, and now make sure the important is the tip of the clamp should be seen. It should not be overlapping with the bone. And then you put provisional K wires, and this is how you can fix the screws uh, later on uh, by knowing that you are confirmed it uh, that it is in place. Now, the, uh, another literature which I didn't quote that said even if you open reduce, there is about four to five percentage chance of malreduction. Then, from fifty percentage, you are better off to ninety five percentage. If you're doing close reduction, there is a possibility of 50% malreduction. Now we have reduced it to 5%. So definitely the present concept is to open reduce the mal, uh, especially open reduce the center sponsor, especially when you're thinking about fixing it with a screw. So in conclusion, syndesmotic injury is not a significant, do not ignore it. It is a very important injury. At times, you have to look at their very high index of suspicion when you don't have a fracture. Do not miss it. Restore the osseous anatomy of all the fracture component. Most importantly, when you're looking at syndesmosis, posterior malleolus is as the medial equivalence. Pre-op CT, post-op CT would be ideal to assess the reduction. Anatomical reduction, again and again, I've been saying that it is very important to reduce the problems. You can do with variety of fixation, whichever you feel happy about it. It doesn't matter as long as you have done an anatomical reduction. And removal of syndesmotic screw is at present not indicated. Thank you very much for your patience. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Dr. Rajesh, so uh, that was uh, quite a good uh, description with regard to the uh, the things, uh, the syndesmotic injury itself, uh, Dr. Uday Kumar. So would we have a couple of questions now, or uh, how do we go about it? So. Okay, now somebody has asked, okay, this is probably a question, sir. A couple of questions have come in. So one is like, why was the medial malleolus not fixed? I think they're asking you. It was a part one, medial malleolus was fixed after the syndesmosis. So this was just for the lateral side, the fibula, syndesmosis, and then the medial malleolus is fixed later on. So we, I didn't show the, we are talking about syndesmosis, not about the ankle. Right. Right, 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 right. So there, and there's one other question which just appeared, but I don't see it now again. Uh, Rajesh, can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Oh, I mean, uh, when would you do an open reduction of the syndesmosis? Is there so, any uh, specific uh, criteria that I will, as I'm operating, I will do the open reduction? Uh, the present recommendation is try to do open reduction whenever and wherever possible. So um, uh, you do it in all possible contexts because the amount of malreduction is so very high that you don't rely on your CM pictures intraoperative. Because many a times, even within the experience hand, even I have done then and then after my, I mean after learning to it. When we have taken post-op CT, we found that uh, the fixation with the screw is little mild reduced. Though at times the incisor is so uh, big, so you're not very sure whether uh, the thing. That is the advantage of the this tight rope. Tight rope helps it to fall in little bit. But intraoperatively, if you have a little bit of doubt, even in doing tight rope, that the medial clear space is not reducing well then I will have no second thoughts about opening. It's a small open, nothing big. You just look, put a probe and feel uh, clear of the syndesmosis, uh, this thing, and look at it. 
and then you can uh, so there are people who even say the scopically you can see you can ask sundar about it but open reduction when you are opening up anyway doesn't just a small incision within the incision ajay there are two more questions with the chat box yes one was with regard to uh, weight bearing if the screws have broken so i think we can yeah that i think uh, dr rajesh already answered that he said that screws need not be removed and unless they do cause a problem and uh, one other question uh, can was can i just ask one more question should be repaired uh, can you ligament rajesh can i ask you a question on the syndesmosis yeah can you hear me Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi. Yeah, yeah, I could hear you now. Now you know with all this fifty percent mal reduction, I just did a study of my own where I treated my ankles. I agree with that. Quite a few of them were not in the incisora. But if you look at the patient, especially if you use a three cortices, I think that is the beauty of a three cortices screw because it lets your fibula move and find its place. I think we get away. But instead, you use a tight rope and you mal reduce. There, your problems are. You know, more severe because now we have fixed it. The rigidity is more. So that's what my feel about this mal reduction. Yeah. So the three screws it shows some amount of loosening. The tight rope, if you do standalone tight rope without weight, then it creates a problem. If you put a plate in most of the time, it comes. Is there a echo? A lot of echo is coming. Yeah. I so, think uh, only one uh, among the the thing, only one should be on. Other should be muted. The plate fixation is actually helpful in in. But as I said, both tight rope. Uh, it is not that panacea for all. I mean, the the tight rope is the answer for everything. It doesn't work every time. You have problems with tight rope. So whichever way you are good, do it. It's a surgeon's choice. uh three cortex four cortex tight rope whichever but do it without mal reduction uh, i agree i mean i think that is the difference between three and four cortex if you use a four cortex and you mal reduce then especially if you use two screws then you are screwed because you are mal reducing it so i think three cortex six i think will bail you out is my experience thanks so one other question was regarding whether we should repair the deltoid ligaments following the fixation of the syndesmosis that is a topic of its own i suppose ajay yes. yes but uh, um, but if you have a syndesmotic injury and you have fixed posterior mal lateral mal medial uh, i mean if you do, uh, if you have an isolated deltoid but you have stabilized it very well and there is no medial clear space uh, there is no need for a deltoid fixation but it is not again it is a, not a rule for all you should have there are places where you have to go and uh, repair the deltoid but most of the time you don't need okay fine okay fine i think there are more questions coming in but i think we should uh, proceed uh, we should uh, uh, again we have kept a separate time again for discussion so i think there we can take more questions so can i now request dr sundar rajan to speak uh, regarding the uh, uh, arthroscopy and lateral ankle ligament reconstruction okay ajay can you see my screen yes we can okay uh, good evening can hear you. yes good evening everyone and uh, good afternoon for all our uk colleagues and uh, i take this opportunity uh, i mean to thank all of you i mean our bangalore orthopedic society Uh, for having me here along with all our friends like ananya madan and ajay and i'm seeing all our uh, ajesh which we could not uh, meet in conferences at least we are seeing virtually half and at least monthly once so my topic is on i think chronic lateral ankle instability uh, i think ajay asked me to talk about something arthroscopy when i talk about the lateral instability so i go on with a few slides about uh, ankle arthroscopy but basically the talk is about uh, lateral instability so i will ta- uh, start with uh, one uh, case example of a uh, uh, patient is an 18 years old uh, female patient presented with a recurrent ankle instability 
uh, one and a half years and uh, because of the twisting injury which happened while playing badminton she is a professional she was a professional player continued to play with the strain and but presented with the recurrent instability on examination she had a lax ankle and anterior dryer positive and she had a dimpling of skin on the lateral aspect of the passive uh, during passive inversion and various other food full range of movements so when you have a history of these kind of patients when you take an x ray uh, most often i uh, think x ray is going to be a normal so the basically when you present with patient presents with the recurrent instability of the ankle if you take a normal uh, ankle and lateral x ray it's going to be normal unless you take some time stress x ray you can see a opening otherwise most often it will be normal so basically you go along with the history and then examination if the patient presents with the recurrent instability with the lax ankle sometimes you can have so you do an mri it doesn't mean that all the time the patient will have a atfl tear so sometimes you will have a lax atfl rather than complete rupture of the atfl or sometimes you will have a complete atfl rupture most often if we see a cfl that is a more it will be intact this is the common situation which you see so whenever even you see these kind of patients we know that these patients presenting with the lateral instability chronic lateral ankle instability is one of the common source of ankle dysfunction in a professional players so most often it's an atfl injury alone or could be combined with uh, uh, cfl also As, especially for the beginners to know what is uh, lateral uh, to know about the lateral ligaments what we are talking about is the anterior talofibular ligament which you can, we know that which is coming from anterior lateral aspect of the lower end of the fibula to the talus over here what we talk about the calcaneo fibular ligament is going from fibula to the calcaneum under the peroneal tendons that is called cfl and what we call is an atfl so these two ligaments which we are talking about even though we think about that uh, static lateral ankle stabilizers are both atfl and cfl i think the most often the atfl is the one which is gives the primary constraint to the inversion stress in in the plantar flexor ankle even though we include cfl but most often that gives stability to the subtalar joint rather than the ankle joint so whenever we see these patients it's very important to differentiate between the mechanical instability and the functional instability what do you mean by functional instability this patients may not have a recurrent dislocation or a subluxation of the ankle but they may feel that kind having this kind of issues but most often could be due to lateral ankle impingement so that has to be differentiated that we no need to do a overdo the uh, lateral ligament reconstruction when they have a functional instability so these patients may need just debridement and decompression of the ankle by arthroscopy and also at the same time you rule out other causes in uh, combined causes of light uh, tight gastro or any deformity of the foot like a varus foot or the cavus foot or the flat foot which can be associated it then that has to be addressed along with the lateral ligament reconstruction and also it is important to look for a generalized ligament laxity which can happen especially for the females which i i see in p patients which they have to be examined for the uh, generalized ligament lax laxity on examination the most common test which you do is the anterior dryer test where you hold the uh, ankle where you could do the inversion and do the anterior dryer like what you do for the acl and the anterior translation can be appreciated when compared to the other leg by ruling out if the negative test it doesn't rule out the recurrent instability again so that is just an a test for to confirm that you have a atfl injury other test could be in a talar tilt test can be done by have a forceful inversion but uh, it's good for that you had you, you should have both atfl and cfl injury i think very difficult very rare to demonstrate this uh, in clinical situation in my opinion coming to the mri almost you'll have a 100% sensitivity for the atfl and you can have a 83% of specificity for the cfl however they have a low sensitivity for the 56% of atfl and 50% for the cfl but most often mri is helps you to know that the patient has got an other associated conditions like osteochondral lesions which is one of the common associated features when you have a recurrent instability due to frequent uh, frequent trauma frequent uh, injury to the cartilage when you come to the management of the lateral ankle instability we have a two point of management whether i mean i'm not talking about the conservative management of course you can you should try the all the conservative management by giving all the proprioceptive exercises lateral ankle strengthening program if the fail then you come to the surgical management in that we talk about non anatomical part and anatomical part 
what do you mean by non atomical most often it if we are not doing now it was uh, because of the high failure rate because of the stiffness and the failures where we like where the common procedure like a watts john procedures where you uh, take the peroneus previous tendon off of the tendon you root through the your uh, fibula and the calcaneum and reattach it so this kind of procedures are uh, uh, slowly getting outdated because of the complications so basically when you come to the management of lateral ankle instability we talk about repair or reconstruction whether you do an open direct repair with or without in, uh, uh, augmentation of inferior extensor retinaculum or you do a reconstruction with autograft or allograft the same thing can be done arthroscopically also where both repair and reconstructions have been uh, done nowadays so when you can you do a direct repair whenever you have a good tissue adequate ligament remnants then it is possible to do a direct repair when to do a reconstruction so whenever you have an associated generalized ligament laxity or if it is in a prior unsuccessful stabilization procedure this is a failed case or whenever you have a poor or insufficient ligament remnants then you do on a reconstruction so one of the common procedures are brostrum which all of us know that where you do a direct repair end to end to do a direct repair or brostrum good uh, uh, procedure where you in, you include the inferior extensor retinaculum so that you will have a more uh, support when you do the brostrum uh, repair or like carlson technique where you do a <coughs> holes over the fibula take the ligament and bring it outside in the posterior side and tie it up the this procedure is very commonly done arthroscopically nowadays so when you come to the arthroscopic repair so what are all the techniques which you can use of course we which i call come to uh, the later on whether you can use a standard anteromedial and anterolateral portals or you can use a additional portals like inferior uh, lateral portal which can be used you can use a microlaser technique or you can use a knotted technique or you can use a knotless technique there are so many techniques have been described in the literature nowadays with arthroscopically but what what is important that when you do an arthroscopic repair that tissue quality should be good so that when you do a repair it has to heal and give the stability when you talk about uh, ankle arthroscopy uh, when you do an uh, repair in general you can use the general position which you use for an ankle arthroscopy where you most uh, it is done in the su supine position where you use give a side support so that leg doesn't go for a complete external rotation like what you use it for an acl reconstruction make make sure that the foot is hanging around 15 to 20 cm beyond the uh, table so that uh, uh, you can have a you know space to lever out the foot so and also you can assess all the sides and also if you, if necessary you can use an accessory portals including the posterior portals for the general in general for ankle arthroscopy we don't use i don't use pump but most of most often many people don't use gravity flow system is more than adequate most often we use the 30 degree scope but sometimes we may need to do a 2.7 scope and most often i use only manual traction few of them few people use the mechanical distractor but i feel it's more cumbersome and also there are some complications have been reported when you use a distractor So as already stated, said most often you require only four mm 30 degree arthroscope for you do a lateral instability or any uh, ankle arthroscopic procedure. But however, whenever you have a tight knee, you may need to have a 2.7 mm scope or 2 mm scopes, and also you need a small burr and small shaver. So that is very important, especially when you are going to deal with the osteochondral lesions along with the chronic lateral ankle instability. There is very common associated features, so you should have the 2.7 scope or 2 mm scope. and also with the instruments like shave small shavers and small uh, burrs the two portals which commonly we use the anteromedial portal and the anterolateral portal the anteromedial portal is which we use just medial to the tibialis anterior tendon and between the malleolus and the tibial tendon and the anterolateral portal which commonly use your lateral to the peroneus tendon over here uh, sorry uh, uh, extensor uh, uh, digitorum tendon over there the only structure which you are uh, worried about here is the branches of the superficial peroneal nerve so that you don't make sure that you don't injury injure that so you can you will be able to uh, see that and it is clearly visible over there so most often you draw a, uh, you draw with draw it with a pencil so that uh, you know that after painting you can go lateral to that so that you don't damage the branches so when you do an ankle arthroscopy you make the mark over there first then most often sometimes when it is especially chronic cases when it is scarred it is very difficult sometimes you will feel tough to insert the scope directly 
So you can use 10 to 20 ml of uh, saline to inject inside. You can see the direction of the syringe it is a horizontal, not like an oblique, like knee arthroscopy. You go just horizontal, then open the anteromedial portal, then you insert your 30 degree scope or four mm um, sheath. And make sure that you have a short lever arm uh, scope rather than the longer one, which we use for a knee arthroscopy, uh, which helps you to uh, uh, lever out uh, easily. When you come to the uh, inside the joint, then you uh, do the uh, lateral portal under direct vision. You can see that is the anterior inferior tibia fibular ligament. This is the talus, that is the tibia. And uh, you put the needle, then, then you come, uh, you can op open the lateral portal, then come see over here. Then this is the osteochondral lesion, which is very important than any lateral in ankle instability, even if you do open procedure. You need an arthroscopy to find out the osteochondral lesion and do the procedure like a microfracture in this case. So this is what uh, you do the lateral, uh, it is weaving through the anteromedial portal, that is the anterior inferior tibia fibular ligament, that is a talus, that is a tibia. Then you insert the needle distal to the anterior inferior tibia fibular ligament, especially in the lankel, uh, lateral ankle instability, you go slightly distal to that so that you'll be able to reach the talus better. Then use the shaver to clear the, all the fat tissues and the sometimes hypertrophied uh, AATFL. And uh, then you can come here, that is the talus, distal to the talus, where you see the bare area, just below that you see the attachment of the AATFL over here. At the same time, if you go more proximally to see the fibular attachment, just uh, over the, this is the ATFL attachment and here where you will have the ATFL attachment in the lower end of the fibula. That is the ATFL tendon. This is another case where you see that the, the lateral side, you can see that is the lower end of the fibula. Your remaining scar tissues, just you do the curate clear it with the shaver first, then you can use the curet just to freshen that uh, fibular attachment of the ATFL. You can just you're doing the curate edge over there. Then you can use, there are many techniques that have been described. Now it is very easy if you have a knee scorpion, you can just use the two portal technique. You can take the bites over the remaining ATFL tendon. You can, you can take a two bites, whether you can use a single tunnel or two tunnels in the lower end of the fibula. We can use the knotless uh, anchors, or you can just make it two holes and take it through the uh, holes, uh, the thread uh, posterior to the fibula, and you can tie it up or use a button, or you can use the knotless anchors. This is a very simple technique to use it. What about the uh, results of arthroscopic repair? There is no huge difference whether open or arthroscopy. They found that there is no difference in the clinical scores between the two groups in one year follow up. And this is the open procedure. And uh, you know, if you think, if you, uh, I mean, if, uh, if you are uh, uh, doing an uh, open surgery, it's well and good. Most often I do only open procedure because I, I found that many times the tissue quality is very poor. So I always do a plastron gold procedure. This patient has got a ligament laxity. That's why you are seeing a lot of opening over there. Otherwise, we don't see this much opening when you see the uh, ankle arthroscopy in protein. You see that there is the posterior side. You see the posterior capsule very well. And you can see you are able to see the entire posterior capsule over there and posterior talofibular ligament. And if you, if you come to the uh, medial side, you can see the posterior capsule and you can see that that is the FHL movement, which normally we don't see, but when you have a lax and a, a lax ankle associated with the, your lateral instability, then you will have this kind of opening. Then this patient, doesn't have any osteochondral lesion. So just we did a diagnostic arthroscopy. It was opened up here. You see the intact CFL below the uh, peroneal tendons. ATFL was attenuated and it uh, lacks. So here I'm using the uh, double loaded all inside suture anchors over there so that I can have a four bites and have a two knots over the uh, ATFL uh, remaining ATFL. You can see that it's a detached ATFL from the fibula. The another flap which I elevated and holding with Alice forceps. So I take uh, four bites through the, all the four uh, uh, bites through the uh, remaining ATFL from the teller side. Then I use the sledding lot, which we use for a shoulder arthroscopy. Once you're done that first layer repair directly to the bone, which by holding the foot in 
you have a slight aversion and dorsiflexion. Then I do the knots of uh, all, both all the four sutures. Once you have done that, then I use the same threads to take the bites through the remaining flap and includes the inferior extensor retina club. That is the remaining flap over the fibula, the ATFL in the fibula, and this is the inferior extensor retina club. So I use the same threads to take the bites over the both the flaps, inferior extensor retina club, and the remaining flap in the fibula, so that I do the second layer repair. So that will give you the good, robust, st stable repair. So once you have done that uh, complete repair, then you can see that there is a very good repair over there that is stable ankle. So what about the results? So the brostrum procedure or a brostrum gold procedures, usually they, you have a very good results of getting a functional score of around more than 90, 90%. Whenever you, whenever if we think that the tissue quality is not good, now people use the internal bracing, like where you use a suture tape. I think they have the mechanical and cadaveric studies have shown that they have a very good strength. There are a lot of comparative studies that have come up in the literature showing the direct repair versus direct repair with the augmentation with the ligament um, uh, tape, tape, which they found that that ATFL with the suture tape augmentation was found to be at least as strong as a native ATFL. And the biomechanical studies have showed, some studies have shown uh, good uh, stability over there. Already I discussed whenever the ligament quality is very poor, we can use a ligament reconstruction, anatomical reconstruction. What do you mean by anatomical reconstruction? We make a both holes in the anatomical site of the ATFL. One is in the fibula, another is in the talus site. Then you detach the part of the peroneus brevis tendon over there. Then you can insert in the both the side and put the interference screws. To conclude, arthroscopic or open direct repair in patients with a sufficient ligament quality provides good to excellent clinical outcomes. Of course, when you need a reconstruction, when there, whenever there is a failed procedures or whenever there is a generalized ligament laxity or a high body mass index, then if the power is that if the tissues quality is very poor, then you do a reconstruction. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sundarajan. That was excellent. So you covered the whole thing completely and so so concisely with regard to the instability, right to the repair, the reconstruction, and the usage of the internal brace. All of it was very well in, the, uh, in that. And uh, so can we look up to a few questions? I think there are no questions related to th this. So I think one thing. Uh, yes, sir. Dr. Kalpesh has got a question. Yes, yes, sir, Dr. Kalpesh. Um, Dr. Sund Dr. Sundarajan, that was a very good, very good presentation. Um, I, ju I just wanted to add uh, my take on this subject, if if that's okay, that uh, because uh, it's it's very common here, and um, I must be uh, doing like one case per week. Um, so a couple of years ago, I did a review of my cases. I had done two years ago. I had done forty-two uh, brostrums in one year, and. Uh, I I do I I diagnose my uh, the the instability. Uh, I don't rely on MRI. Uh, my main uh, diagnosis relies on the history and and uh, uh, examination and X-ray. And the reason is that we I, I don't we don't want to give an impression that this is uh, something that only happens with an injury. Because there is a large group where uh, you have a uh, what's called as a subtle virus, subtle cavus. So if you examine the foot, it does not look like frank cavus foot, as uh, which is easier to identify. But this one is my somewhere slightly less than the cavus, which takes some time, some training to actually spot it. But these patients, because they are in subtle cavus, they are always overloading on the medial side and they easily rupture the ATFL. 
um, that is one category. Another category is the ones which you have mentioned in your presentation, and I agree with, is the hyperlaxity, patients with hyperlaxity. And again, these are the ones where you will not, not have a ab abnormal MRI, and you will not have a abnormal physical drawer test. And the third category is the ones where there is uh, a what we call as a high ankle sprain. So uh, the previous uh, presentation from Dr. Simon, uh, you know, the syndesmosis injury, uh, which is not acute, it is subacute, and it, it is treated as a box standard ankle sprain, but actually the injury was slightly higher in the ankle, and these ones go on to remain unstable. If you take, they will give you a history of instability. But if you do a drawer test, it is again negative. If you do an MRI, again it is negative. So the history for me is is very important. I base my decision based on the history. Secondly, and one last point is the X-ray. Uh, if you do a weight bearing X-ray, then you probably don't need an MRI scan because if it is your box standard ankle instability, if you do a weight bearing X-ray, you do a lateral view, then you will see a subtle anteriorly sublux talus on the tibia, which again, if you're not looking for it, you will probably take it as normal. I'm not saying you do, but I'm saying that just for everyone's sake is that to look out for that subtle instability where the talus is slightly sitting forwards. Um, and also one more thing is the, if you, if you have a history like your case where it was 18 months uh, history, then I would expect some uh, anterior osteophyte on the x-ray. And again, that should be seen as a sign of instability. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely agree, Kalpesh. I mean, as you uh, told, I mean, we don't have a huge uh, case load of ankle instability, like what you do, like a weekly once. We, I mean, probably I do maybe a 10 cases per year. That is, that is just a huge volume for us. Uh, in my opinion, I think all other panelists agree in India, we don't get so many cases of uh, uh, ankle instability. Yeah, but uh, sorry, I don't want, you know, that's, I do, I think it's something that you look out for. If you think, if, yeah. if it is, because in the general mind, perhaps it is related to an injury. You know, like yeah. it has to be a, someone who is a sportsman and has had an injury. But what I'm saying is it's not necessary. You know, maybe almost one third of my patients did not have any of this. Some of them even had normal MRI scan. Yeah. I, I agree. I mean, mostly, as I said, that MRI is uh, is not a confirmatory test for your ankle stability surgery. Yes. The most often, the history is the most important thing uh, to diagnose the lateral ankle instability. At the MRI is, I think, most often here people comes with MRI only. If they come to any tertiary center, they come with MRI only. And most often, we see that whether normal ATFL or sometimes they get reported as a lax ATFL. Very few cases will have ATFL rupture, of course. As I said, I mean, you all, as I also agree that MRI is not a diagnostic one. So most often the history gives you a clue whether this patient has got a lateral ankle instability. Yeah. Can I have to come in as good, sir? Come to me. Just uh, Mr. Kalpesh, you know, when we see this instability patients, sometimes they have subtle virus. When do you decide to touch the calcaneum and when do you just say, let's primarily do the ligament, come back, you know, in a primary setting? So, uh, you know, if you document that uh, this patient has a instability with subtle virus, I'm, the first line of treatment should still be what you would normally do for a ankle instability without virus. But the uh, addition of a procedure will be your second procedure or should be in general. Uh, you, you save it, you reserve it. Uh, so again, you know, it's uh, if you identify it and you mention it, then next time if that was to fail, then you can go back. I'm not, I wouldn't, I, I myself don't add a osteotomy for such cases. Very occasionally, you know, it's generally still the same thing. I wonder whether we can use a tight rope, you know, that uh, internal brace for those cases, because now you know that they're going to load more. Is that, I mean, I'm just, it's just a hypothetical question. Well, it's. Um, I don't think the tightrope will uh, will will give you that benefit. That it kind of only reinforces the repair. I think apart from that, it doesn't have any role with regard to the uh, presence of a virus. I don't think that's my feeling on that. 
Okay, now, uh, yes, now can we proceed? Now uh, we have uh, Dr. Ananya who would uh, tell us about uh, arthroscopic anticlusion. Dr. Ananya. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, BOS for this opportunity. And uh, I, it would not be fair if I don't mention Mr. Kalpesh Shaya here because I went to Golden Jubilee to learn orthoplasty and uh, I saw this gentleman with so much passion for this. And, um, and this is what my journey of foreign ankle started. So I would like to thank you, sir. So this one, I'm uh, just going to uh, start with my experience. I'll just talk about arthroscopy. I think most of it, Mr. Sundarajan has already covered. And then I'll look at my views and my cases and see whether this is the hallmark and can it actually replace an open ankle fusion? I think that's the answer we're trying to look at. Okay, so the OR is to look at ankle arthritis, the role of arthroscopy in various stages of arthritis and uh, any tips and tricks that I can share. And finally, can this replace an open ankle fusion? So indication-wise, they are the common culprits. I think in an Indian setting, post-traumatic appears to be the commonest cause, uh, but inflammatory arthritis, especially psoriatic arthritis, I've seen a couple. And primary ortho osteoarthritis still remains quite a chunk of them. And finally, a sequelae of chronic instability, uh, which is quite uncommon in Indian situation. So how do you classify ankle arthritis? I don't think there's any clever classification out there. We start with stage zero, which is normal. Stage one, we have early osteophytes, but no joint narrowing. And stage three, you have osteophytes with joint space narrowing. I think it's important to differentiate these two stages. I don't know whether this, in every case they follow each other, but if you want to do a chylectomy, if you see an osteophyte, I think it's important to make that distinction. Is it just an anti-osteophyte we are dealing with or is it associated with a generalized arthritis? Uh, and the final is obviously a complete loss of uh, articular surface and uh, arthritis. So the role in ankle arthritis, I think in these three areas, one is loose bodies, which can form. And uh, secondly, synovitis, which is commonly seen causing a soft tissue impingement. And I think it's not adequately picked up in the clinical examination because if the MRI shows no loose bodies, nothing we say she should not have, he or she should not have any trouble. But I think these produce a lot of synovial fluid and they typically get this soft tissue impingement which you can reproduce. And I think arthroscopy has a very good role in this case. And finally, when you see an anterior osteophyte, what you call is a footballer's ankle, it can help us to remove that osteophyte. So these are loose bodies usually seen in the cutters, quite easy to get. Uh, it's not like the knee that they can lose, they can get lost and you can find them and you just remove them, grab them, especially when you have mechanical symptoms of locking or giving way. I think it's worth doing arthroscopy in these cases. Uh, this is a synovitis I was talking to you about, especially you get this lateral gutter, uh, which is has this inflamed synovium. And I think uh, doing an arthroscopic uh, uh, Cyanovectomy followed by a steroid injection definitely will give a good results. May not be in the long term, the situation may continue, but it will help you not only in giving relief, but also to get a diagnosis. Sometimes you're not sure whether you're dealing with an infective pathology or what kind of inflammation. I think taking a biopsy here will definitely help the cost. And this was a footballer's ankle. We were talking about that anterior osteophyte, which we can see uh, that is just causing an impingement. The CT scan showing the same. Um, this can be addressed quite well. 
So these are the osteophytes that you can see in the front. Uh, they do cause impingement, especially in dorsiflexion, and uh, these are easily identifiable. But if you're taking an X-ray to diagnose, you need to be sure because the lateral view can sometimes be very, very tricky. You need to get both internal and external rotation of your lateral. Otherwise, if you're taking a standard lateral view, you can miss an osteophyte which might be in one corner. So I think there is a role of CT scan if you're suspecting the patient has symptoms of uh, anterior, you know, anterior impingement. Uh, okay, this is what you do. It's quite straightforward. As you enter, uh, you just go in and shave. But my point here is you need to look for a corresponding lesion on the tailor side. I think it's usually we look at the uh, tibial side, we take off this thinking we have done, but if you look at the corresponding side of the tailors, there could be a bump over there. And I think it's worth spending time to address that. And I think the outcomes are much better when you do that. Uh, and there are some studies to show that if you have anterior osteophytes or if it's early arthritis and the joint is preserved relatively, if you do this, you can at least get four or five years of relief. So if you can cons uh, convince your patient that it's an intermediate procedure, you might arthritis can extend in the future, but I think this will help in the present situation. Uh, this is in an osteochondral lesion. I think obviously it's been already dealt with. So this can be a sequelae secondary to an ankle instability. So you go there, you remove the thing and we do micro fractures. So, that, so this is another way where I think we can use... Okay, so... What I did, I looked at my ankle arthroscopic cases where I've used Scopy to do the fusion. It was a prospective study to see how they're doing. So I had 13 patients. Uh, the mean age is 58 years. Majority were male. And I followed them up uh, an average of 20 months, somewhere from 6 to 30 months. The common diagnosis was uh, primary in uh, five cases, three were secondary to trauma and five were inflammatory. In that five inflammatory, I think two were of psoriatic origin. The criteria, uh, minimum of two years duration of symptoms and should have failed a conservative treatment. I know in India, we believe in aggressive surgery, but I think in ankle arthritis, I think majority of them, at least I've seen 50%, excess shows quite bad arthritis. But when you see them, this fellow is okay. He's not actually affecting his quality of life. So that is something to bear with because if these people, it's not like, like the knee, I suppose, if they're not symptomatic, trying to touch an ankle arthritis on an X-ray, I think the results may not be satisfactory for the patient. But I have a very strict exclusion criteria, which is flexible and uh, quite wide. Uh, if it is an irreducible varus or valgus, uh, in my opinion, a 15 degrees, if the X-ray is showing a tail or tilt, then I'm, I'm going to step back and say this may not be a candidate for arthroscopy. And of course, if it is a post-trauma, a broad-based AVN of the tailors, significant bone loss, especially on the tailor side, and uh, revision cases, definitely this would not be an answer. So I'm quite clear, only if these uh, indications are met, only those are being posted for arthroscopic fusion. And I think this is one thing I think I would like to stress upon, especially young ones who want to, do, want to pursue in foot and ankle. I think this is a beautiful view. I think if you are trying to deal with an ankle case with a deformity, I think you need to know where the deformity is coming because sometimes it could be that it's coming in the subtalar level or the calcaneum is actually in cavus. In this case, if you try to do an ankle fusion, you will be in the middle of the surgery trying to balance this foot and it's no way. So I think this view, because most of the radiographers would not be aware of worth having this picture. So you get this beam so that you understand the alignment of the leg and where the deformity is happening. So that will make your planning uh, very easy. So I use the normal A for score. It's a good score because it has got both the surgeon related al al alignment where we score and patient can also score on his uh, function and his uh, lifestyle. So I think it's a well-balanced score. So I think positioning and all has been taught well. So I just use a side bolster, uh, tourniquet. Uh, we have talked about the nerve. I uh, use the uh, dynamic distractor, as we have said, use our tummy for a good use. So the crepe goes around the tummy and you use it when you want to enter. So I think when you want to enter the joint, you need to keep your ankle dorsiflex because the soft tissues are lax. If you keep it under constant tension, then entering the joint becomes a problem. As you know, it's a small joint. You can't push it further. You will scratch it. So I think this uh, dynamic is always better because you have the ability to 
relax your soft tissues, especially anteriorly when you're entering the joint space. And once you are in there, you can always use to distract. Uh, this has been already spoke, uh, spoken about. So, okay, you go with a shaver. And uh, I mean, for people who are learning, I think these are good cases because there is no injury of you damage in the cartilage. Uh, this takes time. They, this is not a quick procedure. This will take 40, 45 minutes for you to just get to the subchondral area. Sometimes they're quite hard because in, remember they're arthritic joints. So it's not as easy as in a native joint. So you're going through a tight capsule. This arthritis has got this raspers, which uh, unfortunately I don't have it anymore. And I think that's a good one because it helps you to uh, prepare the surface uh, quicker. Uh, eventually you start seeing this. And finally, what you're looking for this is some bleeding subchondral bone. So the talk of this pot welding. See in arthroscopy, I don't think like an open procedure, you will get a beautiful uniform foundation for you to get a fusion. You will have some areas which are uh, like a more prepared than others, which is okay. I think spot welding is still okay. So, but you need to make an effort to get a bleeding subchondral bone. Uh, otherwise uh, still this surgery, the fusion rates may not be that good. So I think once you've prepared this, I think alignment is the key. And I think this is where you need to think in all four directions. It's not just the uh, neutral to five degree plantar flexion. We need to think about the rotation and especially valgus, I think is well told off. I think translation is something that's not well emphasized. I think it's important to push your talus further back under the tibia. And I think that posterior translation helps in their gait. So I think that's something that we don't stress enough and I think it's worth doing. And obviously we understand the foot, it has got is all these alignments in different views and you need to get it in slight degrees of valgus and slight error towards external rotation. So once you're prepared, I use the two screws from the medial side and I think there is any enough evidence to say that two large uh, CC screws uh, do the job. So you get two screws. And these were my early ones where you can see on the lateral view, my screws are not posterior enough. I think uh, this is what I learned with this, that if you get your first screw, the posterior medial screw, if you can get it bang posterior, it actually pushes your talus back. And I think that is something I learned with time. Uh, so after surgery, it's a well padded cast. I used to remember Mr. Kalpesh's uh, dressing that used to be called. So I still try to follow them. So get them dressed, well pad them, do it yourself. Uh, keep them for a day or two. Uh, I, I don't send them the same day. And then see them at two weeks for suture removal. Keep them non-weight bearing for at least two and a half months. But after uh, six weeks, if the x-ray is satisfactory, we let them walk with the air cast boot and see them at three months and six months from there and complete the score. So uh, yes, fusion did achieve in all 13 cases, uh, which was great. And the uh, AFOS score was good. It improved from 38 to 84 post-op, which was significant. Uh, but average time to fusion was roughly nine weeks to two and a half months. I did have my share of complications. Uh, two patients went for delayed fusion. I mean, I blame them to be smokers, uh, but that take almost uh, four months or even actually four and a half months before they completely showed radiological signs of fusion. And I kept him non-weight bearing throughout that process. Uh, two patients had superficial infections, which eventually settled with antibiotics. Uh, one note here, if you start doing scopia and you see some leaky portals, I think it's important to go back in early because what I had an experience with the synovial fistula that forms and these things keep on leaking because it's a joint fluid that's coming out because it's a very, very subcutaneous joint. If you have any leakages, better to address it aggressively, go back, wash it, close it, rather than waiting for things to settle because then if the infection settles in, it's quite easy to get into the joint and then we are in trouble. And one patient had a superficial nerve uh, traction injury, which uh, luckily fully recovered. So I think my point for this is you should not forget the forefoot. When you're fusing an ankle, you need to see what's happening to the rest of the foot. Because if you have not balanced the foot, then it doesn't matter if the ankle fuses, if the patient is not to have a supple plantar grade foot, is not going to be happy with this fusion. And uh, the posterior displacement, as I was telling before, I think is a point that I learned later. And I think it's important to get it. And I think what the literature is saying is it reduces the stress. And whatever my small uh, follow-up shows that they appear to be happier. So that was that. Uh, these are some of the cases. Uh, this is a 50-odd-year-old gentleman with uh, osteoarthritis. 
Uh, this was the first case as I showed. So I think here my screws are anterior. These are at six weeks and this finally united. Uh, this is another patient uh, who had a arthritic joint. And here I think I'm much happier with this one. As you can see, I try to get that posterior medial screw, especially in the lateral loop, bang on. So I think that kind of uh, this position, I think, is much more uh, makes me happy. And they were the two screws uh, which eventually healed. And this is another patient uh, where this was a psoriatic patient I was telling you about. Here, I think the, I was not happy with my screw, the way the screw was holding. So I had to prepare my, the lateral surface and then use a third screw and put him on a plaster for a bit longer. And I'm slightly wary of these uh, inflammatory pathology patients because sometime when you're shaving, you can be aggressive and you can cause real, uh, I mean, I suppose you can do it in open surgery as well, but the quality of these bones are softer as we all know. Uh, this is another patient who caused some problem to me. So this was at six weeks, you could see a huge gap. And I have noticed that in a few of my x-rays as well, early four, six weeks, you see this gap. And obviously I was worried for him. Um, luckily it uh, finally fused. I think because of the spot welding nature that we don't produce, uh, we don't prepare the entire surface. I think you should not get scared if you see this kind of x-rays where there is gap. Uh, I think they eventually fuse. I just have to be patient with them and uh, counsel the patient. So looking at the advantages of what has been claimed that one is a shorter operative time. I definitely disagree with this because as maybe I'm that it's my learning curve, but definitely it takes equal, if not longer for me to do this. Open is easy. Go in, whack the fibula out. You have the whole joint. It's fine. Here, you need, it, it's more subtle. You need to make sure you got all the surfaces. So I think surgical time, I think, is not a valid point. Second thing, minimizing trauma to soft tissue. Yes, I agree with this. So I think compared to an uh, open procedure, this is much more friendlier to the soft tissue. And uh, that's good. Decreased blood loss, of course, but we do it under tonicate. So I'm not sure how much it's important. Uh, Post-operative pain. Yes, I think definitely if you compare arthroscopic fusion person to an open, definitely the, the experience is definitely better because I think you've done less soft tissue trauma and they recover slightly quicker. And hospital stay, I keep them for two days. And of course, open, yes, I think I do extend it to four days because I need to check again, make sure the wound is healing well before I send them. So I think there is a role there. A shorter time to union, I don't think so. I think uh, they take roughly two and a half, three months to heal. And preserves anatomy, yes, that it does. So what is my limitation? My biggest limitation is my selection bias. You see, I'm, I'm very flexible with my exclusion criteria. If something is too awkward, too, too to the left, too to the right, I don't want to do arthroscopy. And uh, two cases, of course, I changed it on the table because I thought that I couldn't correct it. Even after preparing the surface, I couldn't correct the hind foot alignment. And I said, I changed it to an open procedure. I have not included in this study. And third is my sixth sense. You know, we all have this feeling, you see a patient's face, uh, this burger will not do well. So, I mean, it's something that I, I suppose you pick up with experience. And those ones, if you think it's non-compliant, I should do it an open procedure because that's still, I think, a gold standard. So that is my basic selection basis. So when I went back to literature, this is something interesting because this something went with my views. This is as early as in February 2020. They've looked at arthroscopic ankle fusion as a limited advantage because if you start taking out all the bad ones, and you're only doing the young, fit, poor, less comorbid patients, your outcome is definitely going to be better when compared to an open procedure because you're not comparing apple to apple. So this is something that they have picked up also. They said that if there is an osseous operation, that is when the deformities are higher, you're pushing them to an open procedure and you're taking off the juicy ones, let me put it that way, the less deformed ones. So these tend to do better. So they've highlighted my experience, I suppose. So this is one good literature. Of course, these are the rest of the references. So I think, yes, there is definitely a role for an arthroscopic assisted ankle fusion. It is a good surgery, uh, but is it the one that's going to replace an open fusion? I don't think so because there are caveats. You need to be choosy in picking them and you will get a good outcome. So I'd like to finish with this video. Your intentions may be great, but it needs to be executed well. Otherwise there'll be pain for uh, the receiver. Thank you. 
thank you, Dr. Ananya. That was uh, good. So you had highlighted the most of the. Okay. I think you yeah. unshare your screen, I think, so that might be better. So do we have any questions here? Yeah, Dr. Ananya. Yeah. Oh, Dr. Ananya. Yeah. Hello? Dr. Ananya? Yeah. yeah, hi, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, any diabetic patients have you operated on uh, with arthroscopic? Uh, yes, fusion? I have. I mean, uh, two of those patients, but not very badly diabetic, uh, making sure that it's not a, you know, we're not looking at a Sharko or something that's involving the subtalar. Two okay. of them I've done. Um, they were okay. I mean, they're fine. I mean, obviously, this was a better than doing an open procedure okay. in those cases because they also had the associated, you know, the skin changes, the varicose veins, you know, the pattern that you start seeing with this venous insufficiency and all this very early stages, hair loss. So I think there, I think there is a role for this procedure. Mr. Karpesh, go ahead. Please. Um, Ananya, that was, that was very good. Thank you. Uh, you've got good results, I would say. Lucky, I would say. <laughs> and um, I, I like the point uh, you made at the end, you know, that it's not, um, a, replay, uh, it's not a uh, solution instead of an open, because that's a very good point. Uh, and I totally agree. Because um, many a times when I'm doing uh, arthroscopic angle, I wonder, you know, why don't, why not just do it as open? Because uh, it does not really save time. Uh, if you try to prepare the surfaces really well, especially the posterior half of the joint, that is where you a lot of the time. Uh, I, I still clock uh, two hours on my tunica time, you know, almost one and a half hours to prepare the surfaces. Because it's the posterior half of the tibia, posterior half of the talus, which is very difficult to get to. It takes time and I don't like to leave any cartilage around. So, uh, and I also include both gutters, you know, the medial side and the lateral side. So you are talking of a lot of surface to prepare uh, and then fix. So my surgical time, whether it is open or arthroscopic, is the same. I, I don't... And I also don't buy the fact that this is less painful because it's not the skin that is going to give you the pain. It is the, the bony surfaces that are going to give you the pain. So whether you make a small incision or a large incision, I don't think it helps with the pain. But, uh, but it's a good point. I, I like that last point you have made uh, and I agree with it. Thank you. I think the problem with the posterior portion, the patient is surprised. You cannot turn the patient to get from the back. So you are struggling to go from the front and you're using usually the knee scope. I mean, even with the smaller scopes, they take time and the, the capsule is tight. So you are going to spend that quality of time for you to feel good while getting that uh, screw fixed. Yeah, sometimes the usage of a curate, a big a curate definitely helps. So that takes away some time because instead of having to prepare the whole thing with the burr, I think uh, yeah, you know, curate I, at I, least in the areas which are... Think, definitely yeah. you need the angled curates for the back. Yes. Um, yes. But they are not easy to find. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> the <same. laughs> you to get, the, get them made. I think you have to <laughs> give them a yeah. desire and get them get the made. And I, I mean, always you use a third portal to distract the joint. You, know, you use a steam and pin or something to get it distracted. You should get a very good space. And also, I use a lot of uh, your uh, shoulder, uh, shoulder cartilage peeler. So that, that also helps you to do it a uh, bit quickly uh, when you do the cartilage preparation. And I don't uh, prepare the gutters. And also, I don't go extremely posterior one third, which may not uh, require for uh, arthroscopic ankle arthrodesis because you are covering the entire dome along with that, the surfaces on the tibia. And most often, they, 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 do, they uh, do heal very well. Uh, of course, it takes long time as Dr. Kalpe said, uh, the time doesn't change between the arthroscopy and the open because when you do open, you may do sometimes quickly. You do just osteotomy. If you go lateral approach, you do osteotomy, just put a three screws quickly and come out. I think time doesn't matter. And also, as I said, uh, as he said, uh, the pain or the outcome or the union time, I don't think there is any difference between arthroscopy and the open. Okay. Any any other comments or anything? 
Okay. Okay. Then uh, can I just request uh, Mr. Kalpesha to speak to us regarding the total ankle arthroplasty? This is something extremely new to all of us. I think uh, we are looking to you to enlighten us. Yeah, no, I would just like to say thanks to uh, the president, the secretary, Dr. Joy, for uh, for inviting me. Uh, I know I know Ananya. I know Dr. Joy. I met him last year at the IFAS, and uh, I have uh, Shaker with me here, um, who, by the way, is um, um, as soon as he started, uh, he came over. The lockdown started. So it, it was a challenge to keep him occupied, um, but luckily, I, as soon as he came over, I gave him a, a, a project. I said, "You look at the ankle replacements I've done, and you let's find uh, what let's analyze the results." So he is, he is going to present the results after my presentation. So I will speak about the ankle replacement first. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. So, um, just a sorry. I think I've gone. Uh, yeah. So uh, this is on the the picture of uh, where uh, where I work. Um, this green top building is the hospital, which is by the river, and it's a it's a beautiful location. And I invite uh, any of you who is ever going to visit. To, to come and visit. It's a really nice place to work and a nice place to visit. Um, I don't have any conflict of interests in this presentation. Um, I'm going to briefly look at the background of uh, ankle osteoarthritis, um, uh, the evolution of uh, ankle replacement, um, what are the results today, and uh, what uh, can be its future. So um, the ankle arthritis is uh, about 10 times less common than knee arthritis, uh, even though the forces per square millimeter are higher in the ankle. Um, and that's because it's got a slightly different uh, cartilage composition, slightly more proteoglycans, which gives it more compressile strength. Um, it is most often, it is secondary. And uh, it's due to trauma, but a trauma is not necessarily a fracture. You can have a ligament injury as well. Um, so over here we have a malunited fracture fixation. We have a um, osteochondral defect. Um, we have a, a plafond fracture uh, intraarticular. So these lead to secondary osteoarthritis. Malalignment is also a, a big thing, and I certainly I. Um, I see a lot of these because quite often you see somebody who presents like a primary osteoarthritis. So they don't have a history of trauma. They've had no fractures in the past. But if you look at the alignment, and the alignment does not have to be limited just to the ankle. If you look at the whole alignment of the whole leg, uh, think of the mechanical axis, center of the hip, center of the knee, and center of the uh, uh, ankle. And a lot of them will have a bowed tibia, a varus knee, and a valgus deformity, valgus arthritis in the ankle. So that's the alignment I'm talking about. Uh, neurological, charco, cavus, um, inflammatory. Um, inflammatory arthritis is not uh, actually becoming very, very uh, uncommon to see. Uh, that's because of the brilliant medical management here. I understand it's uh, still quite quite uh, a large chunk of practice in India. But over here, I, I don't see many. Most of them are secondary osteoarthritis. Um, about 1% of the world population suffers from ankle arthritis. Um, and uh, it has been treated with an ankle fusion. Uh, mainly for the pain. And uh, here's a picture of an ankle fusion on the left, replacement on the right. But the ankle fusion is not without, without its own problems. 
So you can have, here's an ankle fusion, uh, which has gone into a non-union and it required uh, further surgery. And this time, because of the loss of bone, uh, I had to include the subtalar joint. Um, so the, uh, with regards to the ankle replacement, the first uh, ankle replacement was done in the 70s and it was done uh, with a hip replacement implant. Um, and that's because the hip replacement by that time was around for almost 100 years and was quite successful. So it all, almost 100 years, be, the ankle replacement was almost 100 years behind a hip, hip replacement. Um, obviously, it was not a success because it's not a ball and socket joint. But it was, we can say in hindsight, that it was a failure on which future success was built. However, at that time, there were lots of problems identified with that hip, with that replacement. And uh, the, the whole society concluded that ankle replacement should not be performed. So things went very quiet for about 10 years. But uh, lack of complete satisfaction with an ankle fusion. So uh, here's an ankle fusion uh, on the AP view. If we draw a mechanical axis, which is the green line here, then the mechanical axis should not stop at the ankle. It should go up to the floor. And if, you, if, if that line is slightly medial or lateral, then it puts uneven stress on the subtalar joint and you end up with subtalar arthritis. On this side, on the lateral view, the mechanical axis for someone who's walking is going to be way forwards from the ankle joint. And if you walk faster or if you are very active, it will be even further forwards. And hence, with people with ankle fusion at follow-up, we see they have midfoot arthritis, they have a first MTP arthritis, as well as subtalar arthritis. So this remained a problem. Although ankle fusion is good for pain relief, it is not so good for function. Um, at the same time, the hip and knee replacements were becoming more and more successful. This was in the 80s and 90s. So the interest in the ankle replacement continued because of this. Uh, and around that time, the second generation of ankle replacement came out. Um, these were based on previous results. So now people knew that cement is not a good idea. So they became, un they became cement cementless. Uh, the instrumentation improved. The uh, things like uh, having syndesmosis fixation along with uh, for stability, that idea came in. And uh, it became two or three component design. And there were mainly three uh, players uh, or three implants, star, buccal papas, agility. That's a picture of an agility, by the way. Um, and the overall results were pretty good. Um, uh, there were still problems, but uh, they performed really well. So slowly that brought uh, more evolution in the implants too. And it has brought to the current stage, which is now the third generation. There are about 20 different ankle replacements in the market. Most of them are made of uh, cobalt chrome, uh, molybdenum as a metal, titanium beads, plus or minus hydroxyapatite, um, high molecular weight polyethylene. Um, mostly uh, uh, predominantly mobile bearing, there are some fixed bearing as well. And these are giving really good satisfaction, 90% at nine years. Uh, the 10, 10 year survival is, is pretty good. The AOFAS score has improved um, in according to this study, um, from gone up from 40 to 80, which is quite good. Um, the average range of motion that is preserved after an ankle replacement is 34 degrees. The normal requirement for a normal gait is, is about 20 to 24 degrees. So that is certainly good for remaining someone who wants to remain more active. Uh, and you can see that in the picture here, this is uh, an x-ray I would take every year after one year of an ankle replacement, weight bearing, flexion and extension. You can see the degree of movement that this patient has. Um, better pain relief and functional outcome, um, but it's not without its own uh, 
uh, risks, which is slightly higher rate of complications. And this is perceived to be related to the surgeon experience. Uh, the more one does, the, the, that reduces the number of complications. There is definitely a learning curve. Um, the, the UK perspective, so the National Joint Registry data uh, from, uh, from the last one, uh, there were 843 anchor replacements performed. And that compared to a knee replacement is, is like a tiny number. Uh, it's actually similar to the number of elbow replacements performed in UK. Um, uh, hips and knees, number one, then shoulder replacement, and then comes ankle and uh, elbow. Um, mm -hmm. But it shows how small the percentage is. However, the silver lining, in my view, is that in the last 10 years, uh, it has that number has gone almost doubled. So in 2010, there was only about 400. Now it's about 900. So definitely the number is going up. People are taking it on more and more. Um, the, however, <clears throat> there is still this problem, which is that the mean number of operations per consultant is 5.8. Now that number is actually quite low because uh, to get over one's learning curve, one would need to be somewhere in, uh, you know, at least 25, 30. In fact, there is a paper that has, that has been published from Italy, which says one has to do 28 anchor replacements before one becomes good at it. Um, so by that sense, this number is, is quite low. Um, my personal experience uh, of an ankle of ankle replacements, uh, I've been performing them um, since uh, 2015, so it's about five years now. We can pretty much remove this year, but <laughs> this year has been quiet. Um, I, I, the place where I work, it's a tertiary center. Get patient referred from uh, the whole of Scotland. Um, I've done 51 ankle replacements in the last five years. Um, and as I said, uh, we will look at the results of my cases in more detail in the in Shaker's presentation. Uh, so I won't go into too much just now, but um, I would certainly add that I have had two revisions, one for aseptic loosening, one for an infection. Uh, and I've had a few other complications, medial myelolus, fracture, tarsal tunnel syndrome, wound dehiscence. Um, however, uh, really good outcomes. So every, uh, we collect the MOX FQ, uh, SF36, VAS scores, pre and post at one year, along with patient satisfaction and patient experience scores. And uh, these show a really good improvement in all the scores. And above else, I get happy patients. Six weeks after uh, the procedure, the uh, ankle replacement patient compared with an ankle fusion patient, there is a big difference. By six weeks, the ankle replacement patient is coming, is driving and coming for a follow-up. Ankle, ankle fusion patient will take about nine months to do the same. So they're they are, they are rehabilitated much quicker. Um, I had started using my uh, first, uh, my first replacement was the Integra. And then uh, I currently use the STAR, which is a striker uh, replacement. <coughs> uh, patient selection, as with any procedure, is important. Uh, more so with, uh, if uh, for an ankle replacement, uh, if you look at the literature, then it is up for debate, uh, which is the ideal patient. Uh, for my, from my point of view, uh, it is uh, an older, thin, low-demand individual with minimal deformity. But, but older is not as someone who is old in age. Older is someone who is old as per the physical demands. Um, so the chronological age, uh, body weight, uh, these are, I, I don't use them as a strict exclusion criteria. Um, now and again, I, I have a patient who is young, uh, who is obese, BMI of 40, 41, 
and they recently had a uh, bypass surgery and all they want to do is to be able to walk so to me uh, that high bmi patient is not an exclusion because the demand on that ankle is going to be low so that uh, case case i would i would include that patient um uh, low demand ankle as i said earlier not the same as old age um my youngest patient has been uh, 52 the oldest one has been 82 <clears throat> um and yes the uh, my current uh, restrictions in selection are a a, a deformity uh, and again i would say gro- gro- broadly speaking anything more than 15 degrees is a no uh, less than 15 degrees is a yes but i i do find that um as time progresses my inclusion criteria is becoming wider so before i started with 10 degrees now it's 15 maybe in a year or a year or two it might become 20 um educating the patient is very important um so we have uh, this uh, uh, uh we have this place called uh, foot school so every patient who's going to have uh, surgery Uh, goes to the foot school where the patient meets uh, a team of physio occupational therapist um, and other patients sitting in the same room and they are all having a group discussion on a procedure um the uh, one of the one of the first things i mentioned to the patient as a complication or or i, I don't forget to mention is uh that they will have numbness of the big toe for almost 2 years so this pink zone uh, is the superficial peroneal nerve zone when the incision is in the front of the ankle invariably they have numbness in this patch uh, medial side of the big toe i tell my all my patients that you will have numbness for 2 years so they don't come back to me at 1 year and ask me uh, why am why my toe is still numb um i don't really know whether <laughs> that numbness goes away after 2 years but it stops them asking me any questions um certainly uh, swelling is important to mention uh, because the ankle will remain swollen for quite some time um and i say it is going to be swollen for one year then they accept that and then again they no more questions asked on that um they will start wa- taking weight partial weight after 2 weeks of surgery uh drive after 6 weeks and uh things like golf long walks walking the dog swimming skiing and cycling after 3 months uh the only thing they uh, i tell them not to do early is to play an 18 hole golf uh so 9 hole is allowed or go uh, or playing squash or badminton uh, high impact sports um in terms of uh, pre operative planning uh, because we in in my place we routinely have uh, uh, weight bearing views and the hind foot alignment view that ananya had shown in his uh, slides that is routine for all cases um, sometimes if there is a concern whether there is a large cyst in the tibia or the talus then a ct scan will be necessary Uh, very occasionally uh, an mri will be needed but um, for an from an alignment point of view here is the uh, z line so straight line going through the tibia straight line through the talus and then through the calcaneus it shows the that the subtalar joint in this case because the ankle is in varus subtalar joint has gone into valgus so it's a compensated hind foot um make sure that uh, i have all my implants uh, i have the uh, company rep who is going to cover the case and that would be my pre operative planning surgical approach it is the anterior approach which is i think people who do uh, ankle surgery they will be familiar with it it is the most common approach it is the incision uh, it's the approach to the joint between the anterior tibialis and the ehl and the one thing i would say here is the to get into the joint it's important to go through the sheath of the ehl so that you can keep the anterior tibialis sheath intact it is extremely important to keep the anterior tibialis sheath in fact not to open that tendon at all because if that tendon is opened 
it will create a bowstring and you will have a wound dehiscence. Uh, once we go into the joint, then this is the kind of picture you would see. You have these uh, anterior tibial osteophytes. The osteophytes on the talus is great for arthritic changes. The first thing you do is you remove these distal tibial uh, osteophytes, and uh, then you dorsiflex the ankle. All the all the while keeping in mind your soft tissue handling, and then uh, there is a jig, uh, a bit like a, a, a knee replacement jig, which goes from the tibial tuberosity. It gives you the center of the knee, and then you align the distal tibia in line with the center of your knee. And then you start with your uh, tibial cut first, and then you reference everything based on the tibia. Um, there are other approaches uh, that are used by a very small number of people. Uh, it's a transfibular approach. That's because it's the uh, implant that's uh, marketed by Zimmer as a company that uh, sells it as a transfibular approach. Uh, it's a very small, small uh, market share uh, for that. Um, and then once uh, the so we'll implant is in, uh, sorry, I'm going, That's a six. I'll mute the microphone mic there. Uh, once the implants uh, are in, then the final step is to put the, um, uh, the poly, which is sized, uh, accord, and then uh, uh, should not be too loose, should not be too light, and uh, um, should be balanced. Uh, there are other things to be considered intraoperatively is that depending on the shape of the whole leg, the tibial cut may have to be altered. So for example, if you have a natural bow in the tibia, which um, seems to be common in certain parts of west of Scotland here, uh, then you may have to alter your cut accordingly so that you get a flat cut tibia parallel to the knee. Um, it, is, uh, it is almost a given that you are going to fracture the medial malleolus when you are doing an ankle replacement. Not a given, but you have to be prepared for it. Uh, it is very easily done. That's because by the time you prepare the tibia, then you are having a very thin sliver of medial malleolus. I now would normally put a pin through uh, to protect it and uh, have a very, very low threshold to put a screw if I have any doubts. Uh, sometimes you have to do additional procedures along with the ankle replacement like um, uh, uh, Achilles tendon lengthening, which uh, if you have an arthritic ankle for four or five years, you develop these anterior osteophytes, then your ankle remains in mild equinus for that period of time, you develop Achilles shortening. When you do an ankle replacement, that shortening has to be lengthened. So it, I commonly do this uh, in almost all my cases. Sometimes uh, if the hind foot deformity persists, uh, which is coming below the ankle, you have to add a calcaneal osteotomy. And sometimes you have to fuse the subtalar joint as well. Um, and uh, also a modified brostrum procedure if needed, uh, if there is a uh, lateral instability. Um, the procedure time has to be kept in mind. I uh, tend to have a limit of uh, three hours. So if I'm going beyond three hours, then I will do additional procedures as a stage procedure. I'll bring the patient back. Um, in terms of rehabilitation, they get into a plaster or a boot. They remain non-weight bearing for two weeks, then partial weight bearing for another four. And then they start full weight bearing after six weeks. They are allowed to drive after six weeks and they can do their hobbies after three months. Uh, they get a follow up at six weeks, three months, one year, and then annually. Uh, each year they get a weight bearing flexion extension views of the ankle. They get a, a MOX FQ and others, other outcome scores um, and uh, satisfaction and experience. Um, finally, uh, just an example of a ankle. This is a valgus ankle, valgus arthritis. Um, had an ankle replacement. This is at, I think, three months. And then this is at one year. Um, showing the range of movement that you have at the ankle. Um, it, is, it is really good for the knee and the hip. 
and and as well as for the subtalar joint and the rest of the foot. Um, what is the future of this? Uh, I think the with regards to the primary ankle replacement, perhaps there will be a role for navigation, although I'm not very hopeful of it. Um, robotics might have a role. Um, certainly the procedure technically is challenging. Access is sometimes difficult and robotics can help. Um, custom made implants, is, there, is certain, there is one company that is providing custom made implants because not everyone's talus and tibia is of the same size, but that this adds a lot of cost to the implants. So I don't think it is here yet. Um, if what happens when an ankle replacement fails, then there is a revision ankle replacement, which looks like this. Uh, obviously this takes a lot of bone away uh, to, to put it in. And at the moment, there are only one or two companies that uh, produce this. So that is again a limitation in future. Perhaps there will be more options. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Kalpesh. That was a very good uh, uh, briefing that we had about the total ankle replacement. and. Uh, I think you set me back by four years, but I was just recollecting the time that I'd spent with uh, Professor Hinterman. I'm sure uh, you also must have been there with him. So since you started doing the Hintegra, I'm sure you must have trained also with uh, Professor Hinterman. Uh, I, yeah, well, I, I trained with Alistair Younger, who was his uh, protege. And I, that's where I started yes. with Hintegra. Okay, right. This was excellent. Was watching Professor Hinterman itself was like a such a like a master stroke like an il with Ilan so about seven uh, ankle replacements in India. So it is to be good. And all these combined procedures which you were mentioning regarding the performing of a supramellular osteotomies or also combining it along with the uh, hind foot fusions. Uh, he used to do that with the total ankle replacement all at the same sitting. So I think do you also practice the same way? I think I, I am well, at the moment, I at the most, I have uh, added a brostrum or a calcaneal osteotomy. Um, I'm not that at that stage where I would be able to combine all this within my uh, my the limits of my procedure time that I have kept for myself. Okay. So, but I, if I anticipate, I plan it into two stages. Right. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, I don't Dr. Kapesh, have uh, what about your take on a pantala arthrodesis, otherwise normally which we would go for a fusion, replacing that with an ankle fusion with a triple, do you do that for any younger patient who's got a little more, I mean, I saw your indications, you've been very specific on your indications, but there, there are times when you need, a, when you need to do a pantala. So would you plan for an ankle replacement with a triple or would you think something else? Um, Rajesh, if, I, uh, if there is one indication for an ankle replacement, it is to avoid a pan tailor fusion. So it's not for primary ankle arthritis, but avoiding a pan tailor fusion. So if you are anticipating someone to be going down that line where he or she is going to need a pan tailor fusion, then I think that is the best case where you start planning, thinking about an anchor replacement. It's quite debilitating to have a plant tailor. And in India, we since we don't have the ankle, I mean, I, I have my patients in a real, I mean, I'm looking at them, but I can't help them because it's bad tailor. Absolutely. I, and that is, you know, uh, eight years ago, when I was in uh, Vancouver doing my fellowship with Alistair Younger and Steve Pini and all, they used to say that is, uh, I, I used to ask them, you know, like, what is your criteria for doing an ankle? They would say, number one criteria, avoiding a pan teller fusion. As you know, there is no implant in India yet. We had DPU that has been taken back as it was withdrawn. And I don't see anything in the near future as well. I had only three experiences or got involved in the UK. One of my observations was a range of movement they got post-op. 
these were typically in their 60s females slightly on the bigger side but their range of movement was nothing like our hip and knee of course but they were i mean i would say about 10 degree arc on both sides i mean it, it was a surgeon also was starting earlier in, uh, in that hospital but what do you think does it correlate with their how they do in the future or their scoring and all this does it have a bearing i i i believe so you know you don't need uh, 20 degrees on either side you if you just have 10 12 degrees on either side it works like magic because i i had you know when when patient comes at one year when i when i, I make them walk in the uh, we have a long corridor and i will ask is one of my favorite um, questions if you like you know the nurses the physio i'll say okay tell me which side has this patient had surgery and and they can't tell easily okay they'll say right left they they, they struggle to find out uh, so it is it is that good so even that amount of degrees of range of movement equates to good quality i mean because that was a finding so it doesn't have to be it, it depends it depends on the demand you know if the person is expecting to like here the common expectation is that i should be able to walk my dog mm. i should be able to go shopping etc etc if that is the demand then they will be very happy because if you if you have even if you have less movement 10 degrees 12 degrees dorsiflexion and plantar flexion you are winning because that person will have it the foot will become straight the foot progression angle becomes really straight okay. and the impact that arthritis was having on the corresponding joints so the the pattern that you might notice is that if it is your right ankle then your left knee starts to hurt and then your right hip starts to hurt and then your spine starts to hurt it is like that it goes like that uh, and that has a big impact on those joints and and if you you know the the bottom line is the we talk about mechanical axis you know for those who are doing hips and knees as you know we do routinely do long leg alignment views you know uh, you would have seen them if you think of a mechanical axis in a sagittal plane in your ankle fusion is no way no way it will have give you anything close to normal your load bearing is going to be the front of your knee right in the front and the middle of your foot and that is why they have if you if you if you see someone with advanced ankle arthritis they will very commonly have a bump on the dorsum of the on, on the midfoot because the telonavicular joint has become arthritic it has started developing osteophytes they will also have first mtp hallux rigidus because these are the joints which are trying to compensate by doing a replacement you are reducing that compensation i agree thanks okay right so okay so there doesn't can be uh, here to yeah okay can we uh, listen to shekhar now he would uh, tell us the results of the total ankle replacement okay. yes sir uh, yes sir yes sir dr udak kumar has a question yeah dr kalpesh this is dr anamali i just wanted to ask you in your uh, series uh, did you attempt any orthodontist uh, ankles for a re replacement like you know how things are attempted in uh, hip and knee and what was your experience in doing that so oh, you are you are talking and, about and, uh, converting a fusion undoing an yeah undoing a arthrodesis into a converting it's on, it to it's on the cards okay <laughs> <laughs> it, it it is it is more challenging and um, i have one patient who is a 40 something old female she had a um, hind foot fusion with a nail 10 years ago so she was in her 30s and uh, i last year i have removed her nail because she was getting it's you know she doesn't have an ankle but she is having pain in that area and it's it's hard to convince somebody that if i replace your ankle this pain is going to go away so i started yeah. by removing that nail she still has symptoms which i didn't expect them to go away but i'm hoping that she will be my first case where i can convert yeah. <laughs> all the best <laughs> yes okay uh yes shikhar sir yes. go ahead
first of all uh, i would like to thank the organizing committee of the bangalore orthopedic society for providing me an opportunity to present my, a case study uh i mean study on the case series and also i would like to thank uh, mr kalpesha for sharing his cases i am getting trained under him in foot and ankle surgery i am going to present a case series on total ankle replacement done at golden jubilee national hospital over the last 5 years by using the enhanced recovery after surgery principles in order to reduce the overall hospital stay and also to achieve a day case historically ankle fusion has been the gold standard treatment for end stage ankle arthritis even though a significant percentage of patients do experience pain relief the development of post operative stiffness and the adjacent joint arthritis at a later date makes the overall satisfaction rates to be decreased with the availability of newer generation of implants improved operative techniques and training total ankle replacement surgery which can provide both pain relief as well as a good functional range of movement has now been considered as an alternate and better option enhanced recovery of the surgery principles are being used for hip and knee replacement surgeries across the globe by many surgeons and successful outpatient replacement surgeries are being carried out the same principles are now being implemented in ankle replacement also however there is paucity in the literature evidence due to concerns regarding the post operative pain management the patient complications and the perioperative complications among most of the foot and ankle surgeons eras was the concept introduced initially by a danish surgeon called henrik kellet with the main aim of empowering the patients to regain the independence and recover as soon as possible following the surgery its principles include reducing the overall surgical stress response optimizing pain relief and early mobilization it requires a multidisciplinary approach basically it has four elements firstly preoperative education which is an important part of the pathway wherein the patients are provided with full details about the surgery and the recovery secondly prehabilitation to increase the functional capacity by ramping up the physical activity to which the body gets preconditioned to cope up with the surgical stress and next adequate post operative pain relief is a key element in which enables the early recovery of the patients most of the time it is done by an appropriate regional anesthesia and finally rehabilitation wherein the patients are mobilized as quickly as possible after the surgery golden jubilee national hospital is a high volume center for hip and knee replacements with the principles of eras being embedded in its work culture ankle replacement surgeries are being performed since the end of 2014 and in 2017 the concept of foot school was introduced as a part of routine for all the patients who undergo the replacement ankle replacement surgeries initially the patients will be assessed in the outpatient clinic and the decision about the ankle replacement surgery will be made after dis discussing with them by the treating surgeon they will be provided with a leaflet which contains the information about the surgery as well as the recovery and the pre operative assessment in terms of the disease active disease level will be done by giving a questionnaire they will be booked for surgery and referred to foot school for the pre rehabilitation program all the patients will be admitted on the day of surgery after the surgery they will be reassessed by the eras team comprised of physiotherapist occupational therapist and pain management team who will decide and also facilitate the same day discharge the foot school is comprised of a team of physiotherapist who initially assess the patient pre operatively regarding their physical status and also educate them about the post operative instructions such as keeping the limb elevated moving the toes bending the knee etc 
all the patients uh, will get to practice non weight bearing and partial weight bearing and also stair climbing they will be provided with a walking gear such as crutches or a walker frame for them to practice at home the occupational therapist discuss with the, some of the social aspects such as requirement of a transport or a support at home and in case the patient will be provided with a two man ambulance or a home care and next a nurse navigator will do the pre operative investigations and finally the anesthetist will do the pre assessment and regarding the medical fitness all the informations will be passed on to the coordinator who runs smoothly the entire process of admission to the discharge so this is a retrospective study done by analyzing the uh, patient records of 51 patients who underwent total ankle replacement surgery end stage ankle arthritis uh, was the main indication in all the patients the contraindications were similar to any other joint replacement surgery with addition of 15 degrees of both varus valgus mal alignment males outnumbered the females with an average age of 70 years incidence of primary and secondary arthritis due to inflammation was more compared to the post traumatic arthritis which is quite different from the literature evidence which says post traumatic arthritis uh, are the more more common uh, the probable reason could be because Uh, non inclusion of some of the minor trauma cases such as uh, ankle instability and ankle sprains and also our center being elective uh, hospital wherein the trauma cases are will not be referred and managed all the patient, all the surgeries were performed under general anesthesia with popliteal and saphenous block by using 40 ml of uh, 0.5% levo bp vicane which played an important uh, role in the post operative analgesia for uh, nearly 24 hours all the surgeries are performed by a qualified single foot and ankle surgeon by using standard surgical techniques all the patients received one dose of pre operative antibiotics and tranexamic acid the post operative protocol is different from that of hip and knee replacement because foot being a peripheral part of the body and wherein the post operative swelling and hence the wound healing problem is common and hence all the patients will be immobilized with a back slab and allowed non weight bearing for the initial 2 weeks later partial weight bearing with ankle range of movements will be started and full weight bearing after 6 weeks post operatively all the patients uh, received dvt prophylaxis for 2 weeks in the form of uh, injection heparin most of the patients had medical comorbidities however majority of them belong to asa grade 1 and grade 2 majority of the patients also were overweight 35 cases have been followed for one year the common uh, additional procedures done was percutaneous achilles tendon lengthening uh, due to the achilles tendon tightness and in one case due to the deformity in the leg a distal tibial and fibular osteotomy was performed prior to ankle replacement and one patient underwent modified brostrum repair for the ankle instability following the ankle replacement surgery the average length of stay was 2 days and 20% of the patients were able to go home on the same day and 37% of patients were able to go home on the next day and 20 less than 25% of patients required more than 2 days of hospital admission there were set of complications one patient had aseptic loosening at one and a half year follow up which required revision in the form of ankle fusion there were two cases with superficial infection which were treated with antibiotics and later got subsided three patients had delayed wound healing one patient had component mole position where the talar component was tilted at 3 month follow up and required a revision component placement one patient had persistent medial side pain and after the clinical examination and investigation it was found out to be tarsal tunnel syndrome who required tarsal tunnel release at a later date there were three cases of intraoperative medial malus fracture 
uh, even the literature evidence says that this is the commonest complication during the surgery. About 20% of incidence of medial fracture, medial malus fracture has been recorded. There was one case of deep, late deep infection at one and a half year follow-up. Again, uh, required an ankle fusion. 36 patients uh, attended the foot school, out of which nine patients, that is 25% of cases, got discharged on the same day of admission. And 42% were able to go home on the next day. And the reasons for not doing a day case was also analyzed. And in more than half of the patients who attended the foot school, it was found out that the problem with the transportation and home care was the reason for not going home on the same day. Only three patients had poor mobility post-operatively and two patients had persistent pain due to which they couldn't go home on the same day. And three patients initially were labeled as not suitable for day case because of their poor mobility status preoperatively as assessed by the foot school rehabilitation program. We have also analyzed the results among the patients who attended the foot school and those who did not attend the foot school. And the average length of stay was reduced and more patients were able to go home on the day case in a foot school group. There were no differences in the complication rates between the two groups. However, none of the patient who, none of the day case patients had any complications listed above. We have also tried to analyze the, our results with the only two available similar studies in the literature. The average duration of hospital stay following an ankle replacement surgery as per the literature evidence is between two and a half to three and a half days. And we could achieve only 20% of day case surgeries in our series. And in future, we are hoping to improve it by 50%. Some of the illustration, a 57-year-old lady with post-traumatic ankle arthritis who underwent ankle replacement surgery and at one year follow-up with a good functional range of movement and without any issues, she's able to carry out our routine daily activities. Another case, a 70-year-old male with post-traumatic arthritis who had deformity in the two planes at the distal end of tibia and fibula required the supramalar astrotomy as well as distal fibula astrotomy prior to ankle replacement surgery. A 75-year-old female with a primary ankle arthritis with ankle replacement being done with a one-year follow-up with a component in its proper position and without any issues. So most of the foot and ankle surgeries are now being performed as a day case and Ankle replacement is a new addition to the list. Day case ankle replacement is safe as well as cost effective, provided a proper patient selection is done and also the principles of ERAS being implemented. However, there are certain limitations in the study, such as less number and retrospective in nature, but this is uh, going to provide an insight into the future randomized trials. Thank you, Dr. Shekhar. That was good. So you have uh, like you have been moving for starting from uh, ankle replacements to now into daycare ankle replacements. I think uh, uh, there haven't been any questions on the chat box or in the question and answers. So any comments, sir? I think you can unshare your screen, Shekhar. Yeah. I think um, <laughs> the... Um, it may not look uh, like a lucrative um, option in India, but uh, the the, re the resource criteria and pressures are different here. Uh, so the bed the bed occupancy is uh, is uh, considered to be a prime resource, and there's always a pressure to reduce the hospital stay, and hospitals are awarded. Um, uh, or rewarded rather, if they can reduce the hospital stay. Uh, and I was speaking to Shekhar the other day, and I know that it's, it's very different. Uh, I, if I ask my patients here, would you like to stay in the hospital or go home? They 
always say i want to go home i want to sleep on my own bed and uh, i know it is the opposite in india uh, most patients expect to stay in they expect to be pampered looked after <laughs> two days in the hospital <laughs> <laughs> they want to sleep in other bed <laughs> <laughs> okay uh can we proceed there haven't been any other questions and any comments sir anything anybody okay so can we proceed shall i share my screen so i think we are coming into the towards the last of the uh, discussions today okay yeah so visible as is my screen visible to all can we proceed yeah okay okay so uh, so this is something uh, extra osseous talotarsal stabilization so this is something which has come up as a minimal invasive concept and this is with regard to pest planus so pest planus is something which has been affecting most of the population i think though there are different studies which have come out saying the uh, regarding the incidence itself when we personally conducted a study here we are publishing it it is uh, being published this year now and uh, we have found that out of 323 children school going children in the 14 to 16 age group we had an incidence of pest planus in at least about 31% so a significant number of uh, people normal people so called normal people do have pest planus and of these at least 5% of them are symptomatic so by meaning symptomatic i would say somebody who has got pain or who has been suffering from uh, inability to wear his shoes correctly or has been trying to take some medications for the pain or something of that sort who has certain uh, some kind of a attention to that so that's a very significant number of patients and uh, when i was looking at what are the options that are there i found something which was a uh, quite a simple uh, simple thing which is available and uh, it has now come into india 2018 was when i performed the very first uh, this eotts here in india and uh, uh, that has been uh, coming like almost like a boon so here let us just discuss what are the basic biomechanics of the foot with regard to the talotarsal joint itself what role does the eotts play and how do we select the cases and how should the uh, surgical technique uh, be so these are the terminologies which all of us are familiar pronation of the uh, foot itself so which is a combination of the eversion abduction and the dorsiflexion and supination which is a combination of inversion adduction and the plantar flexion so these have happen in three different three planes of the movement and uh, it is not necessarily only in two planes it's in three planes and uh, we realize this fact also that these two planes are not exactly in the either the sagittal or the coronal planes but they are at angles to these planes so the subtalar axis is almost about 110 degrees angle to the uh, uh, the coronal plane itself and the ankle axis is about 20 degrees uh, so from it's more from the anterior to the posterior so these are the way the uh, this thing uh, the axis of the foot is performed so uh, the talotarsal joint is one of the uh, foundational joint it's one of the most complex joints of the body so it is also called as the acetabulum pedis it's the it's exactly like the acetabulum if you have seen a dissection of that uh, uh, which we have uh, been performing uh, we have found that it's exactly looking like the acetabulum and the femoral head sitting inside so it's just like that the navicular and the tarsal which uh, and the talus which is there it's the foundational joint of the body and it is not been studied in much great detail at all so we have actually not bothered to find out about it because we have assumed that pest planus is something which people are born with and they going to live with it and any problems that they are going to be because of that should be taken care of just by means of some kind of a footwear so we tend to ignore this joint also quite very often and uh, of the other thing it is one other thing note that it is one of the most difficult joint, joints to treat if it is misaligned so well aligned talotarsal joint shouldn't be any prob problem at all but if it is misaligned then it has got a debilitating effect not just on the foot but on the entire body itself so it is 
always better that we look at this joint and try to perform something which can definitely help this. So that the talus calcaneus, the navicular and the keyboard together form the talotarsal joint. And it's the, the uh, basically the talus which is uh, having its articulations with the other joints that, it, that we are talking of. With the calcaneus, it articulates by means of these two facets, the posterior, the middle and the anterior facet. And with the talonavicular and with the navicular, it attaches by means of the talonavicular facet itself. So ligamentous network, of course, there is plenty. There is lateral ligamentous, which is there, the posterior ligaments, which are there, and the medial ligaments, which are there. All of these are definitely playing a supportive role in the case of the talotarsal joint itself. And uh, the, there are, in addition, there are ligaments within the sinus tarsi, which are the interosseous ligaments, and uh, which we tend to, we need to cut if we have to perform this particular procedure. So what's the function of the talotarsal joint? It connects the leg with the foot. And uh, it is the best mechanism which allows us uh, the right kind of weight bearing to happen. So it converts the forces. So this is what it says. It converts the forces which are vertical from the leg into the different forces. So which go through the different facets of the uh, talus itself into the calcaneus, the posterior, the middle or the medial and the anterior, as well as the talonavicular. And the sinus tarsi implant is going to be situated over there, which I've just marked by means of a circle with a cross there. So these are the common movements which happen. So all of us recollect this fact that whenever the foot is supinating, all the forefoot joints are locking up. And whenever the uh, foot is pronating, all these joints are unlocking. Both of these are essential for us whenever we have a normal gait. And uh, these definitely uh, uh, are required for us. And uh, so this is a short video which shows the movements that do happen. It's a CM picture which has been taken. So that's a normally aligned talotarsal joint. So you can see with movement that the movement does happen only at the septular joint and nothing is happening at the talotarsal joint per se. Okay. And uh, so th this is the one which is going to provide both, both the stability and also the instability to the joint. So during the gait cycle, as the heel strikes and comes in contact, there's a foot flat, there's a mid stance and the heel and the toe off. The, the whole foot is going through a series of movements there, which are combination of pronation and supination. So this is where, when there is pronation, which is required is early, early in the mid stance, when we want the whole thing to be, uh, the whole of the body weight to be distributed onto the foot and to give a stability. But when there is a malalignment of this talotarsal joint, which is very easily detected as a pest planus, what does happen is that all of these, forces are going to shift anteromedially. So when they shift anteromedially, there is going to be a collapse which is going to happen in the case of the talus. So you will find that the nearest angle is uh, very much reduced. So you will find that it has kind of uh, declined. The whole of the talus has declined with relation to the uh, first metatarsal per se. And uh, that is going to lead to a lot of pain and pressure on the medial side. So this is also going to increase the period of prolongation and uh, because of this, you will also find that the patients have got a lot of pain on the medial side. Their tibial is posterior strength to hypertrophy and all the other uh, uh, things that do go with it. So what would happen if there's a talotarsal joint, which is uh, recurrently subluxating? So this, you're thinking of the tibial is posterior. You have to think of the plantar fascia. You're thinking of the first metatarsophalangeal joint in this case. So all of these will definitely get affected whenever the foot is going to hyperpronate. And this is happening, mind you, with each and every step that the patient is going to take. So the amount of pain that they are going to suffer is something which is unimaginable. And uh, I think we should be taking these quite seriously. Different treatment options are available. So orthosis is one of them, but not everybody could be settled by means of an orthosis. And all of us know that India, as a rule, we are a barefoot population. We try not to wear uh, footwear as earlier as much as is possible. So we might need, in addition, we might need different corrective procedures or sometimes in correctly identified patients, we might do just a sinus tarsus screw and uh, be done with it. So this is one of the earliest, the first patient of mine, 11 year old boy at that time, and he's having pest blindness. So you, uh, and it is more than two years now I have followed him up. So you can see that on the right side, I have performed the surgery of the EOTTS. There's hardly any scar visible. It's a small incision over here. 
and this is the side which I have not performed the, uh, the EOTTS. So you can see the amount of the foot size that you can, the difference that you can notice. So this, when caught early, you can bring about all these changes. So the patient's foot can retain a normal size. The patient, uh, he need not, he did not develop this splayed kind of a foot, which is common with the pest, uh, with the pest planus. And you can also see that the arch also develops very well. So this picture I thought was probably the best that would represent how the foot is positioning. So this is on the right side and this is on the left side. So right side is the one he has undergone the procedure. You can see the alignment, how well it is. And this side, he still has some amount of an abduction. So he has come for the left side. So once his school went in for closure, so he came in and got the procedure done. So this is the left side, which of course is very, very flat. And uh, uh, we have to, the right side wherein the arch has formed and the foot is aligning itself very well. So this is a constant process which happens once the stent has been inserted. So how do we go about selecting our patients? So the ones who have got uh, uh, stability, which uh, recurrent tarsal joint instability are the ones which we can pick them up. So if we are performing a uh, fluoroscopy on them. If we tell them to bed pair and to uh, on one leg and try to correct themselves, there it's possible that they can correct themselves, both on the right as well as on the left side. I was just trying out with this particular patient. So this is one way of objectively evaluating if the uh, patient is an ideal candidate for the RT, uh, for the sinus tarsal implant. So you can mark out there uh, if you are doing both the stances. A non in the weight bearing stance, an uncorrected foot wherein the talus is declined. You can see the nearest angle there. And on the other side, you can see that the whole thing is corrected. So if you are going to place the stent over here and get this talus corrected, then this declination will come down and everything else that goes with this uh, uh, pest planus will be corrected. So the whole of the forefoot, the whole of the foot size, everything will get corrected. So these are the weight pairing radiographs which we are going to take both in the uncorrected as well as in the correct position. So this is uh, something, there's one added thing we can add on to is to check the way their weight bearing is happening. So this is the areas where the weight bearing is happening in this particular patient. The heel, she's bearing a lot of weight and all along the middle aspect of the foot, she's taking a lot of weight here. So though she has some amount of an arch, you can see the irregular uh, surfaces in which the weight is being born and which regularizes itself the moment these stents are inserted. So this is the same patient. So you can see the amount of uh, uh, pest planus that she had over here and the valgus alignment, which on the day one following the surgery, this is mind you, the day one following surgery is when she's up and about and you can see the correction which has happened. Okay. So this is uh, something which we can notice very well. And uh, that's the reason I thought maybe we should be thinking of taking up this kind of a procedure. One, it is quite minimally invasive. You can just see the way the surgery goes. So this you're looking at this, I'm showing it on a cadaver. So that's the lateral malleolus. That's the anterior uh, tubercle of the calcaneus. Midway between the two is where you mark out the line. And uh, both your tenor, the nerves over here, Sural is over here, the superficial peroneal is here, and exactly at the midway of this is where the incision is placed. It's generally in the same plane as the lines of the, uh, the wrinkles so that the cosmesis is a lot better. There is a special tear, uh, scissors which is available called as the tenotomy scissors. Cut the, uh, the ligament, the interosseous talocalcaneal ligament with it adequately, and then we are going to introduce a guide. So this guide is going to be in the sinus tarsi make sure that it is in the sinus tarsi, image it in both the planes, AP and the lateral, and then use a different sizer. So once you use a sizer, you will know what's the size of the implant that you're going to choose in this particular patient. And so just quite simply, you just have to insert it there. So it is as simple as that. Things which we need to take care of is how well inside this uh, the stent has gone in. And uh, the neck of the, the neck, the line of the neck of the talus is what is the outer limit. So the implant has to be within it. So that is what is considered. The same thing being shown on one of the patients here. If, uh, she uh, also had got a, a, a bilateral stenting was done for her. That's the stent which is placed. And uh, the different views that we can take paraoperatively, 
to make sure that we have got the implant in correctly. So this is the line that I was mentioning about the line of the neck of the talus and the implant has to be medial to it and not away so that it stays there inside in the correct position. So that's what the lateral ankle, uh, lateral x-ray would also look like in these patients. That's the amount of scar which is seen. So that's the tip which has been applied. At the same time, we also make sure that the, if there's any tendo Achilles which is to be lengthened or something, we can perform it percutaneously at the same sitting and make sure that there is a very good range which is available. So here I'm just showing it this way, but of course we always check for it in inversion. Okay. Yeah, so that's the amount of eversion which is present in this particular patient. So this, uh, this thing has to be, uh, the strength has to be in such a position that it does allow some amount of eversion to happen, the normal amount of eversion to happen. All it is going to do is lift up the talus, lift up the talus, bring it in line with the first metatarsal and thereby prevent any other complications which result from the declination of the talus which has happened. So the rest of the uh, uh, forefoot and all which was following it is the one which will be prevented. This was a 13-year-old boy, uh, again, during his, uh, this lockdown. So he said that his parents felt that uh, he's only playing too much. So let's do something useful about it. And they came in with this particular procedure. He was actually referred uh, because he has got a hallux valgus here. And a surgeon had offered him a procedure for the hallux valgus saying that a surgical correction of the hallux valgus is mandated in this, in this particular boy. Now, uh, I assessed him and I found him to have this kind of a uh, pronated uh, foot. So with this, if we do any procedure only on the hallux, it is not going to help in any way because the deformity is definitely going to recur. Because the primary pathology here is at the hind foot, at the tarsal joint, and not at the MTP joint. So this, we did take his bed bearing x-rays and saw him also place the stent there. And so this is how he is. So you can see the difference that it has made to his uh, x-ray itself. You can see that this is the way he was. This is the, you can see the position of the first metatarsal here, the rounded shape of the head, the rounded contour of the head, which was there, which has corrected itself to a normal contour of the head with this amount of flattening and the hallux valgus itself has corrected. So a single single stent application minimally invasive stent application is helping in all this. So this is the boy when he came for staple removal, the suture removal, and the only complaint that his mother had about him was that he is playing badminton too much. Please tell him not to go down and play. That he has undergone a surgical procedure. Tell him to stay at home. So he was not rely, not willing to do that. And this was at suture removal, which is just two weeks into the procedure. So that's his uh, the arches which are developed in this particular patient. And sometimes. Just the stent alone might not be sufficient. We might, and only uh, the TL lengthening might not be sufficient. We might need to combine it with a proper lengthening itself in certain indications, like wherein this particular patient was a cerebral palsy with a residue. So in this patient, I had to combine it with the stent to get a good result. One other patient very recently done by me. So this was somebody who had a, uh, valgus inclination like this. So you can see the hind foot is completely in valgus on the right side. The left side was not that bad. And uh, his main complaint now was knee pain, which he had started developing. So the Salzman view, the view which uh, Anane had told us and which was re-emphasized again by Mr. Kalpesh also, is the Salzman view which we take. And this is going to tell us the orientation of the calcaneus and the talus with relation to the tibia. So this is how the talus and the uh, the tibia were well aligned, whereas the calcaneus itself was subluxated this way. So, so this is the amount of uh, uh, subluxation that this particular patient had. So it had to be combined with other procedures. So of course, I did a medial calcaneal osteotomy over here and uh, got the uh, slid down to the middle set and added a ureteous stent to this. So this is what he was looking at at the immediate post-operatively. And the valgus was uh, well corrected, the arch was restored, the axis of the foot was reached, and uh, these were his post op x rays. You can see them, this is immediately post operatively with these staples still there. And he came for a follow up just uh, two days ago, six weeks now. You can see that the valgus is well restored now, so he has got back his foot into 
as neutral an alignment as possible. You're starting weight bearing from this day now. So I had started on weight bearing from that day. The arch is coming back to normal with this weight bearing. And the rest of the forefoot is definitely going to follow the, uh, the, the hind foot and uh, heel up well. So this is his uh, six week follow up x rays that we can see. And the uh, angles and all are being as near normal as possible. Okay. So that's about it. So uh, thank you for, uh, for giving me this opportunity, uh, BOS. And uh, this is with uh, Dr. Coughlin, so who was here during the I first gone at Delhi this year. Yes, sir, any comments, anything? Yes, sir, Dr. Kalpatius. Yeah, Ajoy, that was, uh, that was excellent. Uh, it was really nice uh, pictures you had, uh, good correction of deformity. Uh, it's a different uh, population that you are drinking. It's a different um, uh, case mix. Uh, I, I don't see these here uh, because a uh, lot of them are treated, managed uh, with orthosis. Uh, I assume pretty well, uh, but also the fact that, as you mentioned, you know they are sh short, short and unshort population. Uh, that's that's one of the different. The, the, I, the, I wanted to ask you, what about the pain um, after surgery? Like long term, what happens to their pain? Are they, how much better are they? They're uh, very much better. So I, though I haven't done any scoring on them, like say with, with regard to the objective scores that we tend to take, I haven't done them that way. But then the main thing they used to always complain of was the medial sided pain been just underneath somewhere in the region of the sustentaculum and all of them have reported to me saying that that pain has come down. Mm -hmm. I haven't done too many, so I must have done about some 13 or 14 of them only till date. So, but because uh, I'm and, choosy with whom I do this for. And were there any where you had to remove the implant? Uh, no, I haven't, but uh, I might have to, if it dislocates or something, mm -hmm. then uh, it would definitely would need a removal. Because one of the, uh, is it not true that one of the concerns is that it is uh, overstuffing? Uh, the, uh, if we use the right size of the implant and we are uh, getting and see so what this is going to do is it's going to, it's only going to block the excessive pronation. That's all, the, that's the role. And if we have achieved that with the correct size of implant, I, I don't think we should have a worry with that. Mm -hmm. And finally, was there any patient where you were not able to do a corrective X-ray? Uh, corrective X-ray is not possible with everyone because uh, sometimes patients do understand, sometimes they don't. But then I think the best uh, evaluation is happening clinically. It's when you're seeing the patient, just tell him to stand and uh, try and see if he can form an arch, if he can correct himself. I think that would be the best. An X-ray would be needed only in case you want a proper documentation to, for, uh, say, for whatever purposes. But uh, it's the clinical judgment which is the best. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I would expect a lot of them to have uh, some form of coalition. Oh, okay. So th that is not something which is this is indicated at all. It is definitely not indicated for a coalition. So this is indicated only for the flexible pest planus for symptomatic, the hyperpronated ones. When we are dealing with the rigid pest planus, like with say a coalition or a post complete insufficiency or something, then all the other procedures which are required are needed. So with the coalition, we would go in for an excision, whether it's a calcaneo navicular or a fusion or some other procedure would definitely be more appropriate than an EOTTS. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yes, so one Mali had yeah. something to say. Ajay, that was a nice presentation. Actually, I think so we discussed about this. I had asked you some questions about this implant very early, three or four years back. Right. I don't know whether you remember or not. Right. My question is, how how early can you intervene? What, what is the best, uh, you know, earliest period you can intervene? Like, you know, can we have something like a school screening program or something like that and pick up the kids earlier? 
so that they don't have the secondary dynamic changes and minimal deformities before you know this implant can be planned anything like Correct. that so i have yeah the earliest that i have used it is at 11 years only i haven't used it at anybody younger to that but then the makers of the implant itself uh, dr graham who he was here incidentally he came here to uh, introduce the whole concept to us so he was saying that he has used it at the age of 3 mm. so that is a little too much for me what too, i felt too, was that that's too you know aggressive yes yeah. so i think uh, 10 years is when the arch most for, most often forms in most of the adults so by the age of 8 to 12 is when the calcaneo navicular fusions are getting symptomatic i think that's the ideal time when we should start looking at these patients so a school program will definitely be beneficial also this one shikhar had something to say yeah i was uh, just about to ask about the tbl is posterior dysfunction which is one of the most common cause uh, for the acquired uh, pes planus deformity so just want to ask whether you right. consider uh, this as a cause before choosing the option of uh, iprocure and if if it is present then uh, no, no. how would you go about it no no if it's an, so uh, uh, tbl is posterior insufficiency these patients tend to get symptomatic more in their adulthood okay yeah. and uh, the simplest test that we can the single hill rate the single hill raise test is something which will differentiate so if they are already deficient then there's no point in doing this procedure at all we definitely have to look at something else. so this is indicated mainly for those pesplanus which have medial side symptoms and mm -hmm. uh, uh, they don't have any other means they don't have coalition or any other forms of rigidity Okay. Anything else? So we need to move to the next presentation. Hmm. Question. Question. You know, yeah, I think most of the questions have been answered. If there any questions from this, we can take. So I think the, among the pending questions, only one of them was with regard to the. Syndesmosis, I think, which was answered was where do you place the screws? I think uh, that's more or less uh, fairly, fairly standard. I think all of us do place those screws not into the syndesmosis but just just above the syndesmosis. I think that is one thing which uh, need not be clarified. And uh, yeah, I think okay. So there's a good comment. Uh, Dr. Narayan Hulse has commented saying it's a very nice civilized scientific debate and. Uh, There's high to Kalpesh, I think. Thanks to the organizers, I think. Oh, is he here? Yeah, he is there. Narayan will say. Sorry. Narayan will say he is in the audience. He is a delegate. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Oh, I would love to see him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let, yeah. That be possible. <laughs> okay. We can send you his number. You can probably have a personal chat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is there? Is there? Narayan also is there? We can probably should put on his video. Is it possible? Admin, is it possible to? Uh, just a second. We'll try to connect. How come? It. How come Narayan also is? Uh, is he? Does he do foot and ankle or? Yeah, <laughs> he's a replacement, sir. Is he for orthoplasty? Maybe is. Uh, is he for orthoplasty, sir? Okay, to listen to your talk, I suppose. <laughs> hey, Narayan. Where is Narayan? Yeah, 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 Narayan is here. Hello, hi, Kalpesh. Hi, Narayan. How are you? And all the panel. Hi. Yeah, hi. Very good. Very good. Long time see you here. Long time, long time, man. You. Hello. Yo, I think your audio is off. So we can hear him. This is. I can hear him. Hear him. Hear him. Yeah. It was a surprise. <laughs> For. <laughs> Narayan, on demand, you are being brought in. <laughs> yes. Okay, yes. That's him there. Okay. Let to. Uh, I I I, 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 uh, I I remember Narayan um, uh, very well because we were preparing for our uh, uh, exit exams together, 
and narayan was a, was was a c of it was like an encyclopedia okay Good. hello hello narayan knew everything about everything okay. <laughs> hello kalpesh yeah narayan i'm talk, i'm talking about you oh i'm back i'm back in the uh, am i audible yes 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 yes, yes. yes you are uh, congratulations nice uh, cme thank you nice thank to you. see you uh, kalpesh oh i'm i'm very very pleased I, to see you narayan I'm you just excited excited <laughs> to see you oh thank you thank you 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 look the same i must say and as young as ever um yeah, yeah, maybe lost some hair like you not so much but <laughs> I, I, I was say i was saying to everyone that Nara, i we were we were we were taking the exams together and we used to practice and narayan knew everything about everything you know i i don't have to open a I book I, i'll just ask narayan i think i think it i think it just reciprocates to you not me actually kalpesh not he used to be good too <laughs> thank you thank kalpesh we should catch up sometime yeah yeah but uh, I, are you are you nice doing work. nice good work <laughs> thank you thank you no i just uh, I... sorry hello hello kalpesh yeah, yeah. i can hear you yeah. go ahead yeah, so go about ahead. um sorry um sorry i you know we are yeah. i think so there's some problem with your audio narayan will uh, because you know there are a lot of delegates yes, online i probably we will share uh, your number with uh, dr kalpesh nice cme please. with lot of people i think okay okay i Let's think uh, so, we have had a wonderful meeting today and uh, i think dr ajay if there are no more questions can we there are any any more so yes we can yes sure okay. certainly okay. so the bangalore orthopedic society thanks all the faculty who have taken part in this wonderful meeting which we have had and learned a lot of new perspectives about the foot and ankle so the bangalore orthopedic society thanks uh, dr kalpita and dr shekar from the uk dr sundar rajan from uh, ganga hospital coimbatore uh, dr rajesh simon from uh, kerala and we have our people from bangalore dr ajay who has been very instrumental in uh, picking up the faculty and picking up the topic thank you very much dr ajay and uh, we thank dr anand kumar raju and uh, dr shekar who are from bangalore and right now we thank our panelists uh, my good friend dr varmali who is with me and uh, dr avish uh, from uh, kims uh, bangalore who are professors in their own uh, right we thank, we thank all the delegates and uh, we thank you very much for spending your time and uh, educating us about the newer perspectives of putna thank you very much thank you for having thank you. me thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ajay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.